Hello, guys, and welcome to the Stardom Cast Extra. Hello to everyone around the Patreon scape, patreon.com forward slash the Stardom Cast. I'm your host, Rob Goodwin, and I'm joined as ever by Matt Turner. Matt, how are you, my friend, after your weekend of being stretched beyond your limits? Yeah, that was a whole lot of fun. Uh, that's, that's obviously another topic for another day. Uh, maybe even this week's podcast, maybe we could hit on it. But uh, other than me being sore, I'm doing okay. Here in the Northeast, we just got through. Uh, we're on the tail end of what we call fake spring part two. And what we mean by that, and if you live in the New York, uh, New Jersey, Pennsylvania area, you know what I'm talking about. So what will happen, Rob, is, and I'm sure you guys have it there in England as well, is you'll have three or four days where it'll be like 25, 30 degrees above freezing. It'll be, you know, real nice out. You know, you got the air conditioning on, the windows down. And then the next day, it's about like 15 degrees below freezing. So that's uh, what happens to us a lot here. And uh, even yesterday, we had a whole bunch of snowfall, a whole bunch of snow squalls. And, um, you know, we get into the end of March, beginning of April. You don't really want to be seeing that white stuff or you don't want to be talking about the white stuff. But the white stuff that I want to be talking about is the Wonder of Stardom Championship <laughs> around Momo Watanabe's waist for 358 days. I feel like we just need to acknowledge like the progress you've made with these transitions, man. I mean, we've had people say you steal the show with these transitions. And honestly, that one, I didn't see where you were going till the very, very end. And honestly, I'm giving you a round of applause. Well done, my man. Well done. You say they're either gonna get if, <laughs> they're either gonna get it depends on how you look at it, they're either gonna get better or a lot worse. So I'm gonna keep trending on whatever direction I'm going when it comes to these transitions, you know, these ham fisted segues. So thank you, Sarah. <laughs> I I appreciate that. But we did, in all honesty, we did have it was like snow squalls yesterday, and there was like a forty car pile up like about an hour and change away from my house. So yeah, it's a little wild over here, my man. But I'm glad. Uh, how's everything with you over there? Yeah, not too bad. Um, not too bad at all. We're, we're actually forecast snow tomorrow, despite it being uh, the warmest it's been all year. So it's ironic that you mentioned that. But yeah, all good. I did briefly panic as I was texting you that I wouldn't be able to fit in uh, all of the Momo matches as well as uh, the two nights of World Climax. But here we are. We're recording on time. That's very important to note, everyone. I arrived on time to recording. Um, and I've got... All of the matches watched, and honestly, this is one of those... Like, I love doing the retrospectives um, because you can really see uh, the arc and how people change and things like that, but this one especially, because it is so revered, um, I am buzzing for this one, and I know this is one that you've been looking forward to for a while as well. Yeah, I even... Uh, as I, Obviously, there is a lot of matches to watch. Uh, there are obviously 13 title defenses, plus uh, the match that she loses the belt to, and obviously... um. I did watch the Momo Eo match that basically bleeds into the white belt reign from the one match she loses from from February. So, I mean, I know from what I was putting on Twitter, I'd watched, you know, three or four or five matches at a time. And I was I would just constantly thank, you know, the uh, our listeners for a zillion different reasons. But one of them was for voting for this one, because not only do I enjoy watching it, but Momo is someone that I have very similar style to. So I'd watch her like where she would place her kicks and where she would put them in the in the match and how she would build up the kick and how she would sell to build up towards the kick and how she would have the heel feed, you know, for everything. And like, not only was I just enjoying it, um, I was learning from it. So I literally had two notebooks, one to take for this podcast and a one for my wrestling stuff. So like, I felt like I became a smarter wrestler watching this match. Now I know some people out there will say, well, then geez, you should put Momo Watanabe on repeat 24 seven. And I totally agree. <laughs> that wouldn't be a bad <laughs> idea. <laughs> It's funny as you mentioned that actually. I mean, just on just off what you've said, the growth of Momo through this run is phenomenal. From that second match with Eo, um, back in May of 2018, where she does eventually win the white belt, from there she still feels like she's a long way from the icon that she would ultimately become by the time she drops the belt to Arissa. The growth in Momo is unreal and i can't wait to get stuck into this run with you and thank you everyone to our uh on our patreon for voting this to be one of our red belt and white belt uh bonus episodes but 
before we start on this, I just want to quickly make everyone aware of our schedule for April. So insane April, obviously, we've just had World Climax as we record and the return of Kyrie. Um, our April Patreon bonus poll is now closed and the winners are as follows. Unsurprisingly, uh, by quite a way, the Kyrie Hojo White Belt retrospective, because apparently you guys just can't get enough of us talking long form, um, came in as number one. And then number two was the match review Thunder Rock versus Kyrie Hojo and Mako Satomura from Stardom, the highest 2016. So a couple of dates for your calendar. This is how they're going to fall on. On Wednesday the 13th, um, 6 p.m. British Standard Time, we're going to be dropping that match review, Thunder Rock and Kairi Hojo and Mako Satomura. And then on the 27th of April, we're going to be dropping that Kairi Hojo white belt retrospective. Um, and then again, we will put up our poll for the May episode very, very shortly. Again, if you've got certain matches that you want us to watch, then please feel free to put it right and pin it on the thread. Sorry, I got really distracted then because my cat walked in meowing at me and he just wants a fuss. Um, but yeah, Matt, let's delve straight in to the Momo Watanabe white belt run, the fabled Momo Watani uh, Watanabe white belt run. And you might think that this run starts with Momo Cinderella win. However, Matt... Way before that Cinderella 2018 win, Momo has a shot at Io Shirai's white belt way back on the 18th of February in 2018 at Stardom Queen's Fest and actually loses to Io um, in 17 minutes and seven seconds. And you watched this match, actually, didn't you? Yeah, I absolutely loved it. I've, I saw this match maybe a handful of months ago. Uh, just, uh, you know, as I'm getting more familiar with Star, I'm just going down the pike. Obviously, I'm a ginormous Io Shirai fan. I'm a giant Momo Watanabe fan. So it's kind of just going through match listings. And I thought this was the match that she actually won the title. I know she beat Io for the white belt in 2018, but it wasn't. I think it was very uh, interesting and an integral part of the story of the white belt. So, um, you know, she's basically going up against the ace of stardom, the leader of the group that she's in, Queen's Quest. And Momo, for I think in this match, she's like 17, 18 years old. She comes out hot. You know, I'm just going to kind of just briefly go over the match. She comes out, you know, real hot with a lot of kicks, a lot of strikes, uh, trying to basically take Io down. Um, eventually, she works the uh, the chicken wing suplex at Tequila Sunrise, which I absolutely love. And we saw a lot of that, a lot of that move. Yes, we did. <laughs> in, this, in this retrospective, obviously, EO winds up, you know, coming back at her. This is actually a really cool spot where EO has Momo down. She's going for one of her patented dives. And Momo is able to get in the ring because she knows EO really well. She's her stable mate. And she gets in the ring and she cuts her off with a, uh, with a kick and it catches her right under the chin. I thought that was really well. So, but you can see the experience of EO. Uh, it takes over. She winds up hitting Momo with this brutal palm strike. And then, if you go and watch it, when you get a chance, Rob, I know you're so busy, you didn't get a chance to watch it. But if you do get a chance to watch it, EO hits the moonsault, and you and as she's covering her, you see EO and Momo just covered in blood. I'm like, when did this happen? So I went back and rewound it. EO on the palm strike catches Momo right under the chin. And splits are open. And if you ever cut yourself shaving on the chin, and I'm guilty of doing this a thousand times, <laughs> I still to this day do it. You know, all it, all it takes is a little nick, and you can really get going. And uh, after EO covers you, Momo, you know, she gets the win. She checks on her, makes sure she's okay. And you can just see Momo is just covered in blood just from that one palm strike. But I highly, you know, I can't give this match enough praise. It is, if you're taking a look at the matches, you know, for our patrons that are following along, uh, if you do get a chance to watch it, by all means, please watch it uh, free. You know, feel free to give me a com uh, comment on it. I thought this was great. And I had it at four and a half stars. And then obviously, you know, you're, you're breaking Momo down a little bit. You know, she loses this white belt match. And then she wins the uh, 2018 Cinderella tournament and she gets her one wish and her one wish is to go back after the belt that she came so close to winning. Yeah, 
And that's basically the story of how we end up getting to where we are in this retrospective. Um, as Matt said, after losing that initial match to EO, Momo went on to win the 2018 Cinderella tournament on the 30th of April. She beat out Konami in the first round, Jungle Kiona in the quarterfinal, who, of course, the pair are intrinsically linked during this run. And then by virtue of the EO and Mayu time limit draw in the semifinal, went straight into the Cinderella final and beat B Priestley. Matt said that Momo's wish was to go once again for that white belt and she got that wish at stardom gold star 2018 the 23rd of may corican hall and she defeated io shirai with what i believe is the debut of the peach sunrise in 17 minutes and 30 seconds something i just want to quickly bring up at this point at this point it was common knowledge that eo shirai would in fact be leaving and eo actually um references that in her pre-match promo and she's talking very much about sort of grooming momo to replace her as the icon of stardom the leader of queen's quest but the way eo starts this match matt is very dismissive. And it's quite interesting to see Io being so dismissive of Momo and her chances of winning the belt, and then watching Momo against the likes of Jungle Kiona, um, against the likes of... Oh, who else was she really dismissive of? Um, there was someone else whose name I can't quite remember. I'll remember when we get onto, uh, onto that match. But she's very dismissive there. And it's, it, I wonder if the way Io has treated Momo in this match permeates into how she defends the belts later on what do you think yeah kind of and i'm kind of glad that you brought up as usual we're on the same wavelength even though we're half a world away i did have a question here i was going to ask you if it was common knowledge that going into this match that eo would be leaving uh for wwe nxt the reason why i asked that is again this is a match i watched two or three times i absolutely loved it but when when the peach sunrise is hit and there's a one two three you see the shock look on Momo's face, which obviously that's what she wants to sell. She's finally winning this white belt. She's finally defeating the Ace of Stardom. But there's a lot of people on that camera side in the first and second row that had the same shock look as well. So literally, I mean, I had it written down. I'm going to ask Rob this question. And as usual, sir, without me even asking you, you answer the question. But uh, yeah, going back to what you were saying, yeah, I, I see your point where, she, you know, Io was very dismissive, you know, towards Momo and some of the other younger members of Queen's Quest, um, not only Queen's Quest of Stardom, but basically she was saying, you know, everybody needs to train more. They need to train more to get on my level. And Momo kind of got like that, uh, you know, towards the end, especially the second Jungle Kiona match. But this one, this one was a was a barn burner. I mean, Momo starts this one very similar to how she did the, uh, the first EO match, starts out very aggressive trying to set the pace with the strikes. Uh, eventually, EO starts back with the palm strikes again, and I was waiting to see if maybe there was going to be a, a cut-open chin, but uh, <laughs> uh, Momo, I think, maybe fed into them a little bit more safe. EO winds up uh, getting the apron German suplex. Momo spills out to the outside. EO Shirai hits that beautiful moonsault that we've seen a million times that we never get sick of because EO is just so good. Um, then Momo winds up firing back with more strikes, and I, I just love it how whenever Momo is on the ropes, very much like an Okada sense or a, a good boxer with a really good left jab in order for her to create separation or to try to get the offense back. She just throws one of those left or right mid kicks. I think just absolutely brilliant. She hits this disgusting running B driver that I thought poor EO, you know, at this point we know EO's neck is, is pretty bad from all the Mei Utani matches and that B driver certainly Certainly probably didn't help her out any there, huh, Rob? <laughs> Definitely not. Um, something that I'm I'm really impressed with, actually. Obviously, as you mentioned before, we, we've seen a lot of the same moves. Having watched, you know, 16 or whatever matches, you know, in a row, we've seen a lot of the B-drivers, we've seen a lot of the Tequila Sunrises, the Peach Sunrises. But what I was a fan of here was the way that Io Shirai got out of the B-driver on the apron by locking in almost this neck figure four in midair by hanging onto the top rope and that was then mirrored by Mayu Iwatani during their title match and I quite liked the mirroring obviously Mayu and Io are linked but yeah this match was fantastic so many near falls and there was one in particular where we've seen it done before where um Momo reverses a powerbomb attempt into a uh, Samato with double knees and 
the way she did it here was so beautifully smooth. And there were so many mirrors between this match and the one they had in February and sort of little inklings that Momo was learning as she was going on. You know, she learned from the mistakes that she made in that February match. And I thought this was a really, really, really good showing for Momo on a really, really big stage and what would ultimately be the genesis of, you know, her career. She would excel from here. I gave this another four and a half stars. I thought this was great, Matt. I was uh, five stars on this one. And I'll go say that this ranks right up there as one of my favorite Momo matches right up there with the Sherry uh, um, five-star final from last year. I had this one at five stars. This is just another five-star classic from EO and just a really, really good way to stamp Momo. And we talked about it when we did the EO Shirai uh, retrospect ep- episode that you can all, I mean, a rain can always be really, really good for several different reasons, but you want to start the rain and end the rain off with a bang. And she started this one off with an absolute bang. And again, credit to EO Shirai because she ended her rain uh, you know, off with a, with, with a bang. You know, you can always carry somebody or make somebody into a good match. But when you have two performers performing on this level that they're this in sync, I mean, you're only going to have, you know, a four and a half to five star match. So, you know, kudos to both of them in a heck of a way for Io Shirai to pass the torch over to uh, what will eventually be the new leader of Queen's Quest coming up here in a month or so. Yep. And it is worth noting as well that at this point, Io was on a record breaking run with that white belt. Um, This match with Momo would have been the 11th. Um, title defense she had she was obviously unsuccessful so 10 successful title defenses and you'll see why that's so important moving on um however her first defense momo watanabe would be against jungle kiona at stardom goddess of destiny on the 17th of june 2018 and there is quite a lot of backstory here and i want to thank um armani shoe exchange for just filling me in a little bit on this backstory because i actually many, many moons ago wanted to do a Queen's Quest versus Jungle Kiona feud retrospective, and I'm sure that's something that we'll do on the Patreon soon, but I actually have a lot of those notes, and obviously they fed into this retrospective, so thank you. Um, But the big story behind the whole feud is that when Jungle was a rookie and Momo was 15, 16, um, they were in a tag team called JK Green, who were very popular as like the babyface underdogs and even had a belief leave a tag title match um, against Thunder Rock. Um, The very next show after EO turned on Mayu um, and then went on to form form Queen's Quest by bringing in Hazuki, Momo was tagging with Mayu and also turned on her and joined Queen's Quest. Um, After that match, Jungle ran in, tried to get her to reconsider, um, but Momo said that she didn't need her anymore. And basically the same reason EO turned, um, said Jungle was holding her back and didn't have what it takes. Um, Momo then tore her ACL, was out for the better part of a year. Um, then when she came back, she went on a crazy run, um, went on, had that towel match with EO that we've already talked about, won the Cinderella, um, and then beat EO in the rematch. Um, and Jungle basically just kept being jungle and having outstanding matches. Um, this event um, that we're talking about now, the Goddesses of Destiny, is actually Io Shirai's final stardom show. Um, it was a sold-out Corrigan Hall in what was their largest crowd ever at the time with 15, uh, 1,571. Um, and it was chosen to main event that show. So a huge rub for Momo Watanabe and for Jungle Kiona on this big, on this biggest of stages. And Jesus Christ, Matt, did they tear the house down with this? Yeah, and as usual, Rob, we're on the same page. I literally have in my first note that I've actually noticed not only with this match, but a lot of the matches in this run that um, this this uh, Momo Watanabe white belt. Rain is main evented in a good majority of the matches, and there's some of these shows that it's actually main evented over the red belt. So that just goes to show you how much stock that they had in Momo and the white belt at that time, and th- and the fact that this was the main event over Io Shirai's final match. To me, that completely uh, blew my mind. But yeah, this was an absolute barn burner. Can you imagine being at that show and seeing those two main events? You know, the Io's final match, which you know the reunition of Thunder Rock for for one night. And then, you know, afterwards, they give her the big send-off. And, oh, by the way, we're not done. 
here's a here's Jungle Kiona Momo Watanabe for the white belt. You know, like you feel like you just want to walk up to Rossi Ogawa and hand him another twenty or thirty bucks, <laughs> like <laughs> just, just for those two. It's just like, wait, do I, I get this all in one ticket? Like, are you serious? But yeah, this is and they 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 do in this matchup. They do play up a lot, and I'm sure you've noticed it, and you probably have it written down in your you know uh, nineteen page notes uh, notebook uh, for this <laughs> retrospective. But they play up their uh, former team, you know, in J.K. Green because they when they go when they really get in towards like the the meat and potatoes of the match and they're trying for all their big moves, they're constantly getting countered. You know, they're kind of they're getting countered back and forth, but eventually Momo um, she winds up relying on the strikes to kind of put put uh, Jungle Kiona on the ropes, and you'll see that, and you've seen it, um, and our listeners that have probably seen all these matches have noticed that, you know, when Momo, as she's getting cooking towards the end, she'll use a big head kick or a big forearm to kind of set up the tequila sunrise into the uh, the, uh, the peach sunrise or the finish. So very much like a heavyweight fighter, a light heavyweight fighter that relies on maybe one strike to set up like a big submission or a big finishing move. She uses it. You know, she used it in the Io Shirai match where she won the belt with the, with the big head kick, and she does it here again. Um, you know, she, she uses the strikes to finally you know, overcome jungle or basically kind of get around the ropes where she can set up that combination of the tequila sunrise into the, uh, the, the peach sunrise. So I yeah, yeah. thoroughly enjoy this match. I thought this was really good. I thought that was a really, it's a really big boast of confidence that you're going to main event this loaded show with that co-main event with this match. And I don't think anybody was disappointed at, you know, at all. And then, you know, at, at, at the end, Io Shirai does come out and basically kind of, gives Momo her flowers and gives her the another stamp of approval on her way out. But I had this one at four and a half stars. I absolutely love this match. Fantastic. I mean, the chemistry that these two have is just tremendous. And there's so much mirroring in this match and the second match. Um, I mean, J- Jungle starts by targeting Momo's leg, um, really trying to work through the kicks that she's absorbing. She absorbs a lot of offense jungle here, and she seems to be trying to absorb it so she can power through and take out Momo's kicks because everyone that faces Momo knows that her strikes are our biggest weapon. There's one particular uh, moment where jungle maneuvers herself into a pinfall so that when Momo kicks out, it's straight into a stretch muffler. And I just love that. I know we saw Kyrie do that during World Climax, but here it was just so smooth. It looked beautiful and momo actually sells the damage really well she collapses after hitting several kicks um it's something that i think momo improves on hugely and i talked earlier about how i enjoyed seeing the arc of momo and that's something that i noticed she sold considerably better later in a run she really grew into that underdog um of selling um she works the neck of jungle including a disgusting b driver which looked horrendous um one thing that i did think was good was after she what? takes jungle out um with this b driver um she's completely comatose on the outside and momo briefly thinks about just leaving jungle there i'll win by count out that's fine but then she thinks about it again and drags jungle in because there's no bragging what rights in winning by count out matt no, especially for your, your V1, especially for your V1, you want to set off that statement really, you know, in, in a hard hitting way. You, you'll see that in MMA fights. Um, they they want to make they want to make it look like, OK, I'm at the top of the mountain. Now I'm here. Now I have all these young lions trying to come up to try to knock me off the mountain. But I need to make an, make a statement. So, yeah, that that was a really cool little subtle thing. That I'm uh, that that uh, I'm glad you picked up on and that you brought to the attention of our listeners. But yeah, obviously she could have won by count up, and then she, you know, she brought her in the ring. She's like, no, absolutely not. I need to make a statement win to show everybody coming for this belt that this is the belt to come for, and I am the, you know, the ace of stardom. Absolutely, and no, I I don't want to gloss over Jungle's um, contribution in this match because Jungle is phenomenal. Some of the sh- the feats of strength that she was able to perform, you know, the gut wrench powerbomb attempts and then the double powerbomb. I just, I miss her so much. She was so good in ring. She was so captivating and she was so easy to get behind as a babyface. almost the perfect foil 
for Momo. Um, eventually, of course, Momo does grind her down, works that neck with the chicken wing, which again we'll see so often during this run, and then finishes her off with the tequila sunrise. Um, Post match, Momo completely buries Jungle by saying that Kiona tried her best, but it just isn't good enough. And if she wants to challenge again, she needs to try her best. Just before we go on to the next challenge, um, I gave it four and a half stars. The match is relentless. The pace is fantastic. And even with the minimal downtime that there was in this match, the pair still managed to keep the red hot crowd hooked and invested in the match for the entire 17 minutes. I'm, I'm a real, real fan of this match. Um, with that being said, Momo nominates her next challenger, former Queen's Quest member, Hazuki. And there's some history, obviously, with these two as well. Um, Hazuki left Queen's Quest after being drafted to Oedetai in the 2018 draft. Um, Io chose Azumi and Momo Watanabe in the early rounds of the draft. Um, and by the time Io came around to try and draft Hazuki, Hazuki had already been drafted to Oedetai. So Hazuki harbors that little bit of resentment to Momo. Um, but instead of Hazuki coming out, we get Diana Perazzo instead, who says this might be her final tour of Japan, and therefore she wants to challenge for the belt before she leaves. Momo agrees to the match in Osaka on the 23rd. Um, Hazuki does come out eventually uh, with the biggest phone I've ever seen in her back pocket, um, calls Momo Momotaro. Now, apparently, that means Peach Boy and is a hero from Japanese folklore, and it's also Kagetsu's favorite name to call Momo. Um, Hazuki confronts uh, Momo and basically says, you're going to be defending against me after Diana Perazzo, and then they get the entire stardom roster in. What made me laugh during this, Matt, was we were having this very heated confrontation between Momo and Hazuki, and poor Diana Perazzo was stood in the corner of the ring just going, do I leave? Do, do do I stay? Looking around for some sort of cue <laughs> as she stood watching these two grabbing each other by the hair and the face and just standing there with like, I don't know what's going on. It really tickled me. <laughs> yeah, she kind of, I think sometimes that they do these interplay fighting with the, the people that aren't on tour because it's like, well, this person's going to be gone in six weeks, eight weeks, ten weeks, whatever, but we need to build, you know, this match coming up in three, four, five months. And sometimes when I watch the stuff goes on, I don't think they have, I don't think they let the uh, the foreigners know <laughs> what's going on. So it's just like, yeah, kind of just play off your character and see what happens. So I don't, <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, that, that was pretty funny. Poor Diana Perazzo. But she's <laughs> obviously, you know, she had a great match. Uh, and the, the the V2, and here we are three and a half years later, and she's one of the best women's wrestlers in the world. So I, I that might be something that maybe she, she may have forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's kick straight into that match three, the V2, defeating Diana Perazzo with the Tequila Sunrise in 13 minutes and 15 seconds at the Stardom Shining Stars 2018 tour night five from the 23rd of June 2018. Um, Mo Perazzo opens by saying she is going to break Momo's arm with her Fujiwara armbar. And for a considerable length of this match, Matt, she looks to make good on that promise. Well, I knew that you probably thoroughly enjoyed this match because you like limb work. And Diana Perazzo, she's all about the Fujiwara armbar. Um, going to put myself over for two seconds. I was taught the Fujiwara armbar by Samoa Joe in the Ring of Honor dojo. So I that is actually one of my go-to finishers as well. So uh, obviously I'm a big fan of Diana Perazzo for one of many reasons, and that's one of them. Uh, you talked about Momo selling in the jungle match. Boy, she got a lot of opportunity to sell in this one because if you were judging this on the scorecard, this was like 64 to Diana. Uh, she basically played, Momo plays right into her, you know, her strengths. She goes, you know, right after the arm, and she works the arm, works the arm, and Momo, God bless her, she tries those kicks to try to come back, but Diana is relentless on the arm. Eventually, she gets in the Fujiwara armbar a few times, and it's looking like Momo's going to tap. Um, even the crowd is kind of buying into it as well uh, due to Momo's facial selling uh, expression. So Momo's selling is really coming a long way pretty quick here because the crowds are biting on a lot of these submission finishes. 
But as always, Momo winds up firing back, getting the crowd exactly where she needs to get her. Hits some brutal head kicks, the B-Driver, and then the Peach Sunrise for the finish. This is a very simple match, again, from a wrestling aspect. I kind of looked at this where they were like, okay, here's the finish. You have, you know, 15, 16 minutes or whatever they had. See you out there. I, I think a majority of this match was called in the ring. And um, by no means is that a bad thing. If you can get two fantastic per performers like Diano and Momo as well, this is what you're going to get. I had this at a solid four stars. And this is just like very basic old school wrestling. You know, for anybody coming up, Trump want, looking to be a wrestler and that's listening to this podcast, this is a matchup that you, it's basically bare bones minimum. It's, you know, they don't do anything too, too crazy. The strikes are there. The selling is perfect. They get the crowd where they need to go. Momo makes her comeback when she needs to. Deanna's fantastic. She knows how to feed a comeback and when to feed a comeback and where to place everything. I thought this match was just absolutely solid, and I had a, at, at a solid four stars. Thoroughly uh, enjoyed this match. Yeah, I mean, I enjoyed it a lot more than I thought, to be perfectly honest. Um, I mean, it was prophetic what Deanna Prazo would say at Corican, um, because as it transpired, this is actually Deanna's second to last show of her tour of Japan, uh, with her last match taking place the following night at the same venue in a losing effort against Momo and Azumi. Um, and she hasn't been back to Japan since. Um, but overall, I thought the story was very simple, like you said, and I enjoyed that story because, as you said, I'm a sucker for a limb work match. The only thing, and this is something that's different between this and, say, the Saki Kashima match, which we're going to be talking about, this match very much played into Diana's wheelhouse, which is fine, you know, as a challenger, you know, as someone from a different country as well, where you might not be able to call it in the ring as cleanly as you would from so with someone of your own nationality. Um, it it told a story of basically what Deanna was trying to do, whereas when Saki or even Jamie Hayter later on, they targeted the leg with the sole purpose of trying to take Momo's leg out of the equation, the kicks and the strikes out of the equation. And I like that a little bit more than trying to take the arm out because it's Deanna's big thing, the Fujiwara armbar. But that's a very small, picky thing. I enjoyed this massively. Um, obviously, Deanna was fighting a battle on two fronts with the fight um, with Momo and her own gear, because I lost count of the amount of time poor Deanna had to adjust her gear. Um, but I gave this three and three quarters. I thought this was a really, really solid second defense, even though, you know, we knew what was going to happen because they were building the feud with Hazuki. Um, but yeah, overall, a really, really solid match. We go on to that third tile defense then. V3 with Momo Watanabe defeating Hazuki with the Peach Sunrise in 15 minutes and 16 seconds at Stardom Bright Summer. Stardom versus Rise Night 2 on the 16th of July 2018. So I just wanted to point out, Matt, I don't know if you saw what else was on the card, but uh, there was a dream mixed tag team match with Kagetsu and Natsu Sumire again and Hiho the Dr. Wagner Jr. So son of Dr. Wagner, Wagner Jr. against the team of Mayu Iwatani, Saki Kashima and Ray Wagner. What a random it, mixed trios match. Yeah, and it wasn't like it was like this intergender card where it's like, you know, uh, stardom and triple A. Like, he was just wild. I'm like, oh, yeah, by the way, then here's Suzuki and Momo killing each other. But, yeah, you're, you're right. I was like, I don't know. Maybe if they were just in Japan, you know, maybe trip, uh, they maybe they were just in Japan doing a tour and they had that date free. And they're just like, maybe Rossi was like, well, when am I ever going to get these two in? And it's like, yeah, we'll throw, you know, Mayu Itani in the match. Sure, why not? You know? Sure. Um, <laughs> speaking of the Suzuki versus Momo match, Matt, the hatred is very, very real. And it permeates the opening with Momo enjoying none of the entrances, none of the streamers. She's literally, the vision of her standing and refusing to break eye contact with Hazuki through this hail of streamers is such a beautiful visual to open the match, don't you think? Yes, and I have a hot take, sir. Here's my hot take. Are you sitting down, sir? I am sitting down. Again, this is my opinion, and I have not seen every Hazuki match. This is the best uh, Hazuki match I've ever seen. Wow! Now I know you, again, I know you were a big fan of this because you said on the um, on the main podcast that how many times have you watched this match for this review? Three times, and I know you haven't seen the match from World Climax. And I said if this one is half as good 
as the World Climax match, uh, I will be absolutely thrilled. And even when I was watching the match when I came home on uh, Sunday, beaten and bruised, I looked over at, uh, <laughs> at Amber and I said, you know, I watched the, the wipe up match a bunch of times. She's like, yes, I know. And I said, I'm just asking for it to be half as good. And she goes, well, can it? And I said, you know, I think I talked about it on the free podcast that it's different because one, they're flipped. You have Momo's the heel, Hazuki's the baby face. And two, this is the main event and it's for the white belt. I don't know. I don't know if Momo and Hazuki are going to get, you know, ample time. But uh, it, it's I'm not going to spoil anything for you, Rob. It was really, really good. You know, and I know you're probably hopefully just a few hours away from watching that match. But yeah, I watched this match three times. And for somebody who's insanely busy, it's very tough for me to watch, you know, get caught up on anything wrestling. But yeah, I wind up watching this match three times. I, I absolutely loved it. And again, I have not seen every Hazuki match. I've seen a boatload of them. I know you're very big on uh, her match from Tokyo Super Wars with Utami. I thought this one was was way better. And for all you listeners out there that think there is a better Hazuki match for me to watch, by all means, please let me know. And I will, by all means, go and watch it, and I will, you know, discuss it with you. But, uh, yeah, I thought this was incredible. I thought this was incredible. And, yeah, you, you're absolutely right, Rob. You can feel the hatred right from the get-go. I mean, just from the strikes. I mean, obviously, we talk a lot about Momo strikes, and we're going to continue to talk a lot about Momo strikes, but you can feel the added hatred in each one of those strikes and the receipts that Hazuki gives. There's one particular moment where she sends Momo barreling into the front row of seats, and she skids miles into the front row. It looks really, really uncomfortable. And I think it goes some way to sort of telling you how much I like this match, that the Uenitai cheating didn't put me off this match at all. You know, I know Kagetsu took the ref out after Momo hit the Tequila Sunrise the first time, but it just built the tension, the fact that Momo was fighting a battle on multiple fronts, as well as sort of fighting this person that she was friends with for so long, and now they're, they're rivals. I just, I really enjoyed that chemistry that they had. Ultimately, Momo won, which of course was the right decision. I gave it four and a half stars. I thought this was a really, really, really solid match. As for the best Tazuki match ever, um, as you said, I'm a very, very big fan of her match with Utami from Tokyo, uh, from, is it Tokyo Super Wars? I can't remember. Is it Kawasaki? I, I think it's Tokyo Super Wars. I could be wrong. It's 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 one of the Super Wars show. I think it actually might be Kawasaki, but that's irrelevant. Um, and I know that she had a red belt match with Kagetsu, which was also very good. Um, I haven't seen that one. Maybe that's one we'll put on the Patreon uh, on the uh, the poll for May. And I know that she had another really, really good match with, I believe, B Priestley. I think she had a really good match with as well. Um, so yeah. Hazuki, fantastic wrestler. Here, fantastic chemistry with Momo. Four and a half stars. Certainly one of the most intense and one of the best matches of a fantastic run mat. What did you give it? Four and three fourth stars. And kind of just, yeah, I mean, you kind of pointed everything out. I mean, this is absolutely must-see. Um, there is this one point where, obviously, you know Hazuki. You know Hazuki comes after momo she pitched to the outside like you said before now i watch this again i watch this three times i have the dvd of the actual show and then when i watch it again for the final the third time i watch it on stardom world there's this one point if you remember before she pitches momo into the seats she pours a bottle of water on her and then she and then when she, she pitches her in the seats on the dvd version it gets edited out and it's only two seconds it gets edited out on stardom world that uh hazuki winds up slipping on the water and she almost eats it which i thought was pretty <laughs> i didn't see that to be perfectly it's probably because i watched it on world um but yeah overall definitely if we are to recommend top five matches from this run this would 100 percent make the cut um she moves on then momo to her fourth successful title defense where she would defeat saki kashima with the peach sunrise in 11 minutes and 33 seconds, the shortest of her title defenses at Stardom X Stardom 2018, the Kagetsu 10th anniversary show on the 12th of August 2018. Now, I don't know about you, Matt, but it's really bizarre seeing face Saki Kashima now after her two year run as a member of a weather tie. Yeah, it's wild as a baby face and the fact that she was so close with uh, Mayu Iwatani. You know, it's kind of weird just seeing, seeing baby face that she's she's not cheating or the fact that she doesn't come to the ring with a, a demented clown. Right, Rob? 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. Or with a weird vegetable crate that's been papier mache. No, it's. <laughs> I honestly forgot. You do forget at times that Saki is a really, really good wrestler in her own right and actually doesn't need to continually cheat. And I actually thought, considering this was the shortest match of the entire run for Momo, I actually really enjoyed it. And I actually preferred it to the Diana Perazzo match. Really? Yeah, because there's some really good... Uh, I'll, I'll go through my notes real quick, and then I'll I'll make the hot tag to you, brother, and then you can <laughs> tell me what you think. But yeah, it's basically Momo starts off like how she usually does with her strikes. Makes sense, eh? That's your bread and butter, and we can knock somebody out with... You know, why not? But Saki uh, winds up targeting Momo's leg. Makes sense. Take take away one of the biggest weapons. There's this really cool spot where she hits back-to-back B drivers, but she can't follow up for the hurt knee. And at that point, that's where the crowd really gets invested. They really get behind Momo. Um, you know, there's there's a, there's some really good uh, uh, falsies. She hits the uh, the revival, the uh, the arm trap. Um, uh, uh, the, excuse me, the arm trap uh, roll up uh, for a close two point like nine, and the crowd really bit on it. The crowd really thought after you know Momo couldn't come back from the knee that 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 would have been her doom. It's just that quick three count, which that's you know as a performer that's what you want. You know at that point in time, okay, we got him. Eventually Momo fires up. She winds up hitting uh, two big head kicks, and then she winds up hitting the tequila sunrise into the uh, the peach sunrise for the win. So I thought that was a really really good finishing stretch. Uh, obviously it's built up towards the the knee work as well. So uh, and the crowd was really, really hot for this finish. I had this at a solid four stars. I thought it did. It went really well. So I'm interested to hear your take on how you uh, I had both the Deanna match and this match four stars. But if I'm going to pick one, oh, I think the Deanna match might have been like in ring better. But you get the crowd like the way you do. Oh, man, that's tough. Oh, man. maybe the Saki match just because. As a performer, I would rather have, and they she, they had it in the Diano match, but they had it way more here in the Saki match. So, yeah, I I think I might I might agree with you. I think I might agree with you that I like this one better than the Diano match. So again, the Diano match was great. Again, really really solid title defense. But I thought though that match was good, the point of that felt like an exhibition for Diana with Momo working a Diana match. But Saki here tells an excellent story with a leg work trying desperately to cut out momo's legs from underneath her quite literally at one point drop kicking the knee while it was trapped in the ropes locking it in a variety of submissions and whilst we'd see this a lot more times as the run progressed i thought because this match was only a shade over 11 minutes they were able to keep up that intensity and I felt like at no point was I thinking, right, let's let's try something else now. Let's try something different. And I thought Saki did really, really well. And let's be honest, this match had a bloody Frankenstein from the top rope. Like, this this surely has to win. Um, but yeah, Momo gave Saki a lot, to be fair, considering she started at initially with that dismissive nature it was actually as i was talking about the dismissive nature earlier on um during the eo match it was the saki match and the natsukatora matches that i was talking about um but i love the fact that she gives saki a lot as a challenger you know she hits the my emblem there's a beautiful transition that you mentioned uh, where she transitions from the Tequila Sunrise into a Kishika Sai. It just looks beautiful. Um, but yeah, overall, it was pretty obvious that Momo was going to be retaining here. Hits two consecutive B-drivers, deadlifting Saki into a second one, which looked really, really, really cool. Peach Sunrise for the victory. Overall, I thought this was a four-star match. Really enjoyed Saki getting that high-profile singles match, which she doesn't often get. And again, she often gets forgotten. But I thought this was a really, really, really solid outing for her, Matt. Yeah, absolutely. Totally agree. And again, that, this crowd was super, super hot. And like you said, no one, you know, going into this, you don't think Saki's going to win. But there were some people in the crowd that got towards the end where they really, really bit. So fantastic work on both of them, and good job on Momo for giving Saki a lot, and uh, that's what you want to do as a performer and as a champion, is you want to make your opponent better um, going out of the match than she is coming in. It shows the diversity of Momo as well, because during this run, she wrestles as both heel and face. Um, You know, she's quite obviously the heel in this match, simply because Saki is still a member of Stars and therefore the de facto face, so she wrestles a more heel style against Jungle Kiona in Nagoya, where 
jungle Kiona is greeted pretty much like a homecoming queen. Um, Momo is the de facto heel, but then against like the likes of Kagetsu or Hazuki or Jamie Hayter, um, she wrestles as an underdog babyface, and I think she does both equally well. And here she wrestles as a cocky, arrogant, dismissive heel. I think she wrestles it very, very well. Um, we move on then to V5, which was an interesting match. Um, it was a champion versus champion match versus Kagetsu that ended in a double knockout in 22 minutes and 55 seconds um, from the Stardom Five Star Grand Prix Night 10, uh, the Grand Champion Carnival that was on the 30th of September 2018. So by this point, The five-star Grand Prix has happened for 2018. And after all their talking about them winning their blocks at the end of the previous match, both Kagetsu and Momo were eliminated on the final night. Kagetsu was eliminated by Tam, Tam getting only her second win of the tournament, and Momo was eliminated after only being able to get a time limit draw with the eventual winner, Mayu Iwatani. Now, Though the white belt and red belt champs have met before, most notably, obviously, with Mayu and Io, this match is apparently the first explicit title versus title match to happen, which I didn't know. Um, How do you think it went, Matt? So by explicit, you mean like explicit language, like they were swearing? Like this is an effing title match? Is that what you Absolute, know? Like, well, it is Kagetsu <laughs> in there, so definitely. <laughs> uh, I thought this was pretty good, but I, and I'm interested to hear your take on it. Again, it's Momo, it's Kagetsu. Uh, I kind of had a really high bar for it, and I kind of missed for a little. Like to me, it, drug, it, it was dragged a little. Again, I didn't think it was bad by any means. Um, but you can tell Kagetsu right from the start, she shuts down Momo's offense. She takes the first portion of the match. Uh, Momo winds up turning it around, obviously with the strikes and uh, setting up the uh, crossface chicken wing, which I love that that she uses the uh, that but she basically uses that almost as a counter, and then to set up the two big suplexes, the tequila sunrise and the peach sunrise as a finish. And kind of, I'm going to throw a question at you, Rob, to see that if you know, has Momo ever won a match with a crossface chicken wing? Uh, yes, she has. She's won a couple of undercard singles match. I think she beat someone like did she beat like a Ruwaka or someone like that with on a on a minor show last year, I believe, but not very often. She uses it far more as a transition for the Tequila Sunrise. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate that. But uh, no, I thought I thought it was good. They had a, a good sprint towards the end, and it looked like as Momo was going to overcome the evil Kagetsu and win the red belt. Kagetsu does what she does best, and that's cheat, and that's by using the mist and by pulling the referee in positions where he can't see. I Kagetsu does this so well. We talked about it before on previous episodes where she does it like, like almost like even better than Muda where sometimes she doesn't even use the other members of Oedo Tai. It's like she'll just pull the ref down or she'll blind the ref for like two seconds or just have him turn, you know, dummy turn the opposite way. And that's good on Kagetsu. And then, you know, good on the ref because you need a really good ref um, in situations like this. So I thought that was really well. Um, Momo, uh, and then she winds up getting hit with a whole bunch of uh, Kagetsu's uh, big moves. She gets hit with the DVD driver, the 450. Momo has one last effort to basically explode out. She hits some kicks, the Tequila Sunrise and the Peach Thunder, but she can't follow up, and the ref winds up calling for the bell and the double TKO. Four stars, which, don't get me wrong, four-star rating is, is fantastic, and I did enjoy this match. But for me, I thought this, this kind of just missed the bar a little Maybe I was thinking of red belt versus white belt, and I was thinking of EO and Mayu level, and that's not fair to any competitor ever, not unless you're Ricky Steamboat and Ric Flair from 1989. Another story for another day, but yeah, I thought this was solid, but you know, I'm interested to hear your take, Rob. I was just a little, I, my bar might have been a little bit too high for this. I was a little underwhelmed on this. No, I, I don't think, I don't think it is. I think the issue is you get a title versus title match, and nine times out of ten, especially on a show that was fairly inconsequential. I mean, they had this was an afternoon show. They had an evening show that same day as well. Kagetsu had two title defenses in two shows on the same day. So you knew neither person was going to be dropping the belt here. So they had to get some way of making sure that neither person dropped the belt. And this was the way they went with. I mean, you heard from the crowd the way that they reacted to that double KO. There was 
utter silence from the Nagoya crowd. And I'm talking, you could hear a pin drop. They were not a fan of this. And especially is the fact that they teased it earlier on as well uh, with both women doing the K-pop. This might, I'd say there's probably two, maybe three matches that went longer than they should have done in this run. This is definitely one of them. The high points were phenomenal. I thought that the high points, you forget how quick Kagetsu, go, Kagetsu is, especially on offense. Um, and there were some fantastic transitions and work that they did. Um, the DVD into the Samato was absolutely tremendous. There was one point where um, Kagetsu just gets a shoulder up from the Tequila Sunrise and then locks in a Kimura lock when Momo goes for another, playing on the inexperience by enticing her in. I thought that was tremendous. And I liked the way as well that Momo changes up a plan and adapts when just laying in strikes doesn't work. And you can also see Kagetsu working quicker and quicker in order to put Momo away once she accepts her as an actual threat, which I don't think she does, or she doesn't seem to, to begin with anyway. Um, of course, there's the mist, which you've already mentioned. There's a hilarious moment when Kagetsu spits the mist into Momo's face, then spits the rest into Daichi Moriyama, the referee's face. So then the ref openly begins supporting Momo, which is really quite funny. Proper tickled me. Um, I wasn't a fan of the finish, but there we are. Like I said, the high points were great. There were some moments that dragged. Um, there was one moment where I think Kagetsu misses the Uida Coast of the 450, and she lands on her feet, but with her knees bent. And the way she lands, I'm amazed both her knees didn't explode. It looked horrendous. But that's by the by. Um, we get the draw. I gave it three and three quarters. It was it was fine. Um, crucially, though, at the end of this, Kagetsu does not call Momo Watanabe Momo Toro during her post-match promo, which perhaps is a little bit of respect shown after taking her the distance. Um, Momo then goes out and calls Mayu out after their time limit draw in the five-star, claiming that if she'd had more time, she'd have beaten her, which cements that as Momo's next title defense. Overall, it was fine. I am with you. I did potentially expect more, but... Again, there's only so much they can do with the restraints of it being a title versus title match, Matt. Yeah, true. Again, great effort. Um, it was a really good match. It's just being title versus title. You did, with these two, you expect a little bit more. So, uh, like, but they did work hard. They did work hard, which is which is always the most important thing. Defense six, then successful defense six, and it was defeating. Mayu Iwatani with the Peach Sunrise in 19 minutes and 57 seconds at Stardom True Fight 2018, the 23rd of October 2018. And interestingly enough, Matt mentioned it earlier, this main event's the Corrigan Hall show rather than the Kagetsu versus Hana Kimura Red Belt match, Matt. Yeah, and you know what the best thing about, for me, watching this match is, and I think I told you, may have told our, our listeners, probably about 80% of the time when I'm taking notes for a match, I wait to see the whole match and then I take it down. I, I write stuff down. So this way I can kind of get everything all together. Sometimes if there's a longer match or there's a point I need to make, I'll write the note down. So uh, what I did on this one is the match finished and I literally just get ready to put pen to paper and then it was time for me to eat dinner. And uh, my wife is a phenomenal cook, hence the probably 35, 40 pounds I put on the 10 years we've been married. Hence why I need to go to the gym and do as much cardio as I do. I'd probably be about two, I'd be probably about 240. So then when I went to, uh, so I got done with dinner, I sat back down, I went to go write the notes. I thought, you know what? I'm going to watch this match again. <laughs> and that's what I did. And because it's Mayu versus Momo and these two have such great chemistry. You know, we talk a lot about the great um, rivalries in stardom. Obviously you have Azumi, Starlight Kid, Sherry Utami, uh, Mayu versus Io, Io versus Kari. This is one that we don't talk about enough because these two are absolutely fantastic together. Uh, this one starts out, you know, close to my heart. The bell rings. They blitz each other with some with, with some strikes. Uh, super stiff, too. I mean, they're just going back and forth. They wind up going on the apron. They tease some big spots on the outside. Eventually leads to uh, Mayu eating a B-driver on the apron. Of course it does. It would not be a main event match or a title match without Mayu doing something absolutely insane to her neck. Um, 
Mayu winds up getting the comeback, hits his pitch, a perfect frog splash, and then she hits a dragon suplex, or she goes for a dragon suplex that gets countered into uh, Tequila Sunrise. Uh, Mayu winds up firing back with a stiff kick to the head, and she hits this dragon suplex route that literally, as soon as Momo hits, they stop. It's like a gymnast, a gymnast, like doing a routine off the bounce beam, and they stick their landing. That's what Mayu did to Momo's neck on this uh, on this uh, dragon suplex. It was one of the most perfect dragon suplexes I've ever seen in my life. Uh, and she she gets up close to uh, eventually Momo winds up coming back with the strikes, hits the locomotion peach sunrise, which I love when she does that. She hits the one and holds on as if that's not hard enough. We literally have your right hand cradled over the person's neck and then you have like a pump handle um, <laughs> down below. So this way you're trying to get the leverage. So that's hard enough, you know, as I'm watching this as a wrestler to do. And then she winds up doing the perfect bridge, holds on. And then she winds up doing another one back to back. I thought this was fantastic. Uh, if you haven't seen this and you're listening to this podcast, <laughs> and you know, what are you doing? Go and watch this match. This was one of my favorite matches of the run. I had this one at four and three fourth stars. And I, I hope somewhere down the line we get another Mayu versus Momo uh, match because I just can't get enough of these two. And again, it's a feud that I don't think not only we, but I don't think the, the Stardom fans talk about enough as being one of the best rivalries in all of Stardom. I thought this was tremendous. Completely agree. Completely agree. I thought both women, in complete contrast to the star of the Kagetsu Momo match, which was quite cagey, these two women went absolute hell for leather at each other to start off with. And Momo is not happy with the resort in the five star. And you can tell this from the way she doesn't give Mayu a moment initially to breathe. And again, it's a good storytelling that she keeps going for her previously broken arm, from Mayu's previously broken arm. Obviously, Mayu had to drop the red belt after breaking her arm during a match with Tony Storm, which is how Tony Storm ended up with the red belt completely by accident. Um, if you haven't go and if you haven't seen it, it's uh, it's not the most comfortable watch, but there we are. So Momo keeps tackling uh, Mayu's arm, which is great storytelling. Now, Matt, something I have to ask you though: Mayu's diving double foot stomp here looks stiffer than ever no knees whatsoever get like usually you see someone's knees they aren't locked so obviously they take a little bit of the of the weight so it's not all on your body but Mayu seemed to lock her knees here it was horrendous have you ever taken one of these yeah I've taken and given them and I always tell people to give a little inside information hey it's the it's the patreon it's what you pay for uh <laughs> you when you're when you're taking a double stomp you want to feed your chest um, you want to put your arms basically at your side and feed your chest up almost as if you're doing like a bench press, um, like almost a short arm grip bench press. Or when you're taking a kick, I always I throw again, I throw a lot of kicks. Hence, you know, one, one of the many reasons why I love this run. Momo throws a lot of kicks. I'm sure you've noticed <laughs> uh, <laughs> when you're feeding for your kicks, you want to feed that chest and feed it out. So one, you're giving your opponent a target to hit and you're hitting hard in a safe spot. And that's what wrestling is all about when you get to these hard hitters like your Shibatas, Kawadas, Masalas, yada, yada, yada. Momo is obviously one of them. You want to hit hard, but you want it to be in a safe spot because you want the connection. You want the people to go, oh, they buried him with that one. But at the same time, yeah, it stings a little. It's wrestling. You know, it's not ballet. Um, but yeah, I, I know what you're talking about here. And yeah, when it comes to those double stomps, you just want to be able to feed feed the correct way. And you, you can kind of give a little, you know, with the knees. It did look really, really stiff. Um, you know, Mayu did throw it, you know, really, really well. Uh, at, you know, at, you have to understand, too, that these two are friends. They uh, they did beat the bejesus out of each other to start. So it's going to be a little bit stiffer. So, but uh, yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. It looked a little stiff, but I'm sure it was somewhat safe because Momo did wind up getting up and, uh, you know, gave Mayu her, uh, her, her little receipt towards the end. God, yes. Um, Momo attempts a B-driver on the outside. And I mentioned it earlier, but Mayu grabs the apron skirt and pulls Momo towards the apron and holds onto the top rope and locks in a figure four neck lock. And it's just something that I really, really enjoyed. And again, it's mirrored in the way her rival, Io Shirai, got out of that move at the start of this run. So I quite liked that. Overall, another fantastic match. The way that Momo reverses that dragon suplex into the re release Tequila Sunrise is magnificent. And then that final Peach Sunrise volley is just brilliant. I gave it four and three quarters stars. These two just don't miss. Before this, uh, they'd met twice and Momo had never won. 
Um, and obviously they've gone on to have matches. They had a match for the Red Belt at the ninth anniversary show, which was absolutely stunning. Go out of your way to watch that if you haven't already. That was incredible. Um, Post-match, Mayu rambles a lot until Arisa Hoshiki takes the mic and says that she is returning to wrestling on the 23rd of November. She also says Momo throws fake kicks and that she has the Brazilian kick, demonstrating by nearly decapitating both Momo and Konami. And of course, Arisa Hoshiki's return to wrestling is very, very important to this run. We move on then to her seventh title defense, which <laughs> is against Natsu Samir, which I didn't expect with uh, Momo coming out on top in 16 minutes and 48 seconds at the Goddess of Stars 2018 night to the 25th of November 2018. Now, how did we get here? So Natsu handed Momo her only loss in the five-star Grand Prix, which would ultimately cost her her place in the final. Apparently in this match, also up for grabs is Azumi, um, <laughs> because Azumi and Konami had previously lost a flag and um, mask match, an Azumi's mask match, um, on the 30th of September, and basically Momo is fighting to get the flag, and the mask back. Somewhere along the line, Azumi is also put up as stakes in this match as well. Um, what a bizarre time. However, Natsu comes out with the flag, with the mask, says she was late to the arena, but she follows up with all of her promises. Um, Matt, what did you think of, to my mind, the only real Natsu singles match that I can think of? You know, even I'm going to in between the Mayu uh, title defense and this one, I just want to just, you know, put the stamp on this is Momo and Utami wind up winning the Goddess of Stardom tag titles, uh, tag league and the tag titles. So it's like they're really in this 2018 going to 2019. They're really all in on Momo and rightfully so. But I kind of I just wrote that in. It's just I just a cool note that I'm like, wow, you know, she she comes into this as a double champion. And we've seen it a handful of times in Stardom, but not as well as really has Momo. Momo did it. Um I thought this was really funny how Azumi, they basically just put her in a chair on the ramp. Like, I don't know. Did you find that comical? And she's so young. What's she, like 14, 15 at this time? I think she's 50. It's when they gaffer tape her to the chair. Yeah, it's almost just like when, you know, when my daughter Lily, when she was a couple years younger, and she got a bad grade in school or she didn't finish her chores, I, you know, she would have to we'd sit around the steps or she got like mouth pierced. So that's, <laughs> that's just, that, if I know. And there wasn't a wrestling match between me and the neighbor to see, like, who, you know, <laughs> where she got to go. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, well, that we went off topic there. Anywho, but yeah, uh, I haven't seen much of Natsumi, which we talked about before. Um, as far as the match goes, I really didn't care for Natsumi's lack of selling. You know, you're, you're literally in the middle of this historic title reign, and Momo is throwing these brutal, brutal kicks. And Natsu's not really selling at all. Eventually, this spills out to the floor, and it becomes a giant Queen's Quest versus Oedo type Raw, which I don't, I'm not a big fan of all this interference, especially in these high stake title matches. And uh, Zumi really doesn't get involved at all. Again, she's basically kind of almost like hog tight to the chair, <laughs> which is kind of funny, you know, it's kind of comical. Uh, eventually, Natsuzumi hits her, the, the Cradle GDT, which I believe is, like, I've, I'm going to say that's her finish because that was her big move they kind of built towards. Uh, winds up getting a two count. Momo winds up firing back with ridiculously stiff kicks. And I don't know if it was meant to be as stiff as she threw it or she was just getting a little aggravated by the lack of selling by Natsusumi. But between the lack of selling that Natsu was doing and all of the interference kind of took away from the match for a little bit. Uh, they really had a hot finish. Um, you know, as always, the Momo finishes with all the strikes going into the tequila sunrise into the peach sunrise. Uh, that always, you know, gets a big thumbs up for me. I had it three and a half stars, but again, it's just the lack of selling from Natsuzumi and too much interference kind of took me out of this one a little. Yeah, the finish is the Yoran Cradle DDT, um, but I, I see where you're coming from. I think this match can perhaps be seen as a palate cleanser in terms of this run. Um, we have a lot of hard-hitting matches. I mean, she's just come off the back of that fantastic Mayu match. So something different... It, isn't necessarily bad. I wasn't a fan of the match, to be perfectly honest. You know, 
with a weather tie, you're going to get interference. And I suppose, you know, by this point or by the end of the run, Momo will have run through Hazuki, Kagetsu, um, Andres Miyagi, um, obviously Natsu Sumiya and Jamie Hayter. And this was the only real one where there was masses of interference. So I suppose we should count ourselves lucky there. Um I mean, Momo spends a significant portion of the opening brutalizing Natsu with strikes until Kagetsu interferes. And I suppose they are telling that story as well, that Natsu is not on the same level as Momo. And the only way she can get on the same level as Momo is by Kagetsu, Hazuki, and Oedatai interfering. So from that sort of standpoint, I see what they were going for, but I completely see where you're coming from as well in terms of Natsu's pretty non-existent selling. Um... At the end of the match, Natsu attempts to renag on a promise on the basis of Queen's Quest interfering for the finish. That, I thought, was very funny, um, considering about as I had literally spent the entire match interfering, but Queen's Quest had come in to save Momo Watanabe right at the end. Natsu attempts to run away with Azumi, again, really quite funny, um, and the flag and the mask, but she's unsuccessful. That feud for Azumi and Natsu would ultimately blow off at the year-end climax show in yet another mask and flag match. Overall, I gave it three and a quarter. It's probably in ring the weakest match of the run. Um, I, I don't want to sound like I'm being negative. I don't think Natsu offered a great deal. But again, this was sort of that palate cleanser. You don't want you know, 15, 16 of the same match. So I can see what they're going for. And, you know, they did what they needed to do. It was a means to an end. So three and a quarter stars, Matt. Did you say three and a half? I had it on the other page. I had three and a half, yes, sir. So as usual, we're right around the same page, sir. So we then got to her eighth title defense because Natsuka Tora came out after the match and basically said this was her claim to the uh, to the title i've just lost my goddesses of stardom belt so i think i should have a title match now in terms of reasoning that's relatively flimsy um but even so uh, momo accepts um and that goes down on the 16th of december at the stardom goddesses of stars 2018 night six she defeats natsu katora with the peach sunrise in 12 minutes and 50 seconds and right from the outset right from that pre-match promo Matt Momo is not taking Natsukatora's challenge seriously I believe her exact words are I am expecting an easy title defense here yeah absolutely and before we get into that just because it was kind of bothering me going back to the Hazuki uh thing we talked about before your favorite Hazuki match. If, and I'm going to give you the cheap plug here, sir. If you turn to page 256 of Living the Dream, <laughs> Stardom 10th Anniversary and Review, you're right, is the Stardom Kawasaki Super Wars. That's where your review of the Utami Hazuki match is. So there you go. I, I just wanted to uh, figure that out myself and give you the cheap plug. So there it is, all in one swing. But I thought this was um, this match, Tora had a really good strategy. You know, we've seen Momo come out blitzing with strikes in a lot of these matches. Tora hits her with two quick spears and has Momo down in pain. And the crowd's really into this right from the get-go because it's like she basically just momo Momo. Like, that's Momo's thing is starting these matches out hot. And uh, she hits her with uh, two quick spears, but eventually Momo gets back up and she hits those brutal mid-kicks. Brutal mid-kicks to kind of take advantage back up. Uh, momo winds up hitting a lot of stiff forearms. Um, Tora winds up coming back with this uh, backslide that the crowd bought. It's crazy that the crowd buys, you know, between this and the Saki, these flash uh, finishes that are going to happen in a white belt match. And I don't know if a, if the white belt has ever changed hands on like a flash uh, finish like that, uh, finish like that, which is just credit to the booking, credit to the matchmakers and credit to Momo and her competitors for her selling it uh, so well. Uh, eventually Momo winds up countering with strikes and she hits that combo, the, uh, the tequila sunrise and the peach sunrise. Solid match didn't go on too long. They played to Tora's strengths. Uh, Momo sold here. Uh, she didn't get. She gave her enough, but not too much. Where it dragged out, as we've seen in some of the other matches. But this match didn't need, uh, needed. Did need it, what it needed to do. This is one of the better matches I've seen Tora have. I thought it was solid, and I had it three and three fourth stars. Exactly the same, man. I mean, should we start calling a Toraberg? 
I mean, four, she hit three consecutive booming spears. And then there's another one later on in the match as Momo comes off the top rope to hit a diving double, so double knees. And Tora spears her out of the air, and it looks brilliant. Um, ultimately, despite momo's dismissiveness of tora's chances she gives tora a lot here i mean she has to kick out of the ascension she has to kick out of a litany of spears and momo and sorry and tora working the back and the neck i thought momo did a lot for tora here and i thought tora looked really really good i mean there's one of the closest two counts i think i've seen in this entire run momo hits the tequila sunrise um, but then decides rather than pinning to go for the Peach Sunrise. But Tora rolls through. And yeah, it's such a close two count. And especially as this run continues, the later we get into this run, there are some absolutely like hair width pinfall calls. There's one in the jungle match. There's one in the Utami match. There's one here. And I believe there's one in the Tam match, which we're going to be talking about shortly. There are some incredible near falls. And this was another one. I gave this three and three quarter stars. I thought Tora did a fantastic job here. Um, they did tease a little bit of dissension between Natsu Katora and Jungle Kiona at the end of the match, but they seem to begrudgingly make up uh, before vacating the ring. They would ultimately break up um, in April as part of the Stardom 2019 draft, which, of course, gave rise to both Tokyo Cyber Squad and to Natsu Katora in Oeda Tai. Now, we move on to the ninth successive title defense, which was at the eighth anniversary show, V9 defeating Tam Nakano with the Peach Sunrise in 16 minutes and 54 seconds on the 14th of January 2019. So how did we get here? Well, after Momo and Utami won the 2018 Goddesses of Stardom Tag League, they only lost one match in their block, and that was to Mayu and Saki. So the year-end climax show, the Stars team challenged the champions for the belt. Now, unfortunately... Tam injured Mayu's MCL in the run-up and would ultimately have to replace Iwatani in the match. Um, after losing that tag match, which was, again, the main event at Corican, uh, Tam challenged Momo for the white belt at the 8th anniversary show, hoping to avenge her loss to Momo a year prior at the 7th anniversary show, which ultimately led to Tam being forced out of Oedetai. And again, that's another episode that you can check out in the archives of the Stardom Cast Extra on our Patreon. Um, there's also the story wrinkle, Matt, that Tam is also desperate to prove that Stars is so much more than simply Maya Iwatani and friends. And it's so similar to the storyline we've seen with Cosmic Angels, Amina and Yunagi being so desperate to prove that Cosmic Angels isn't just Tam and friends, isn't it? Yeah, but you know what? Both storylines work, you know, uh, at copy and a get an a and i should be saying that to a teacher but you know what i mean <laughs> <laughs> absolutely absolutely um i would of course ask um how you feel about this match but as it's a tam match um i feel like i already know the answer um i think both women play their respective roles absolutely magnificently here matt momo the dismissive bully who knows she's already beaten Tam, and then Tam playing the endearing babyface who's selling of her arm is brilliant, isn't it? Yeah, and Tam's strategy is really smart. It's a stick and move. She goes right after Momo's main weapon, her leg. You know, she you know does leg kicks, and she's working on the leg, and then there's the sticking, and then eventually Momo gets frustrated. She throws Tam out on the outside, and then here's the move part. Momo goes to throw that you know, first really big mid kick that she does to kind of stop her opponent's momentum. Tam ducks out of the way and w winds up uh, hitting a German suplex on the outside onto, uh, onto Momo. So you pretty much right from the get go, you know, a few minutes in, it's like Momo can't hit anything. She's getting her leg worked on and then she just ate a big suplex on the floor. So Tam does a really good job reeling Momo here. And, you know, we talked about Momo selling. It's very underrated part of, of this run just because of how, Great, she makes everybody look and her, you know, her legit looking offense. But Momo selling here is it, it just keeps getting better as each match uh, goes on. Um, 
there's some uh, reversals from Tam. She winds up hitting a tiger suplex for a close two, and then uh, and then she winds up kicking Momo, you know, in the head several times. Tam goes for a spider German suplex, which is a, a suplex off the top rope. Uh, Momo winds up fighting off. She winds up hitting a meteor, meteor bunch of. Then she winds up getting a receipt, bunch of strikes, the kicks. You know, she fights through the pain. She kicks the forearm. She uh, works the chicken wing in. Uh, Tam tries to wrangle free, but eventually she winds up hitting the uh, the Tikio Sunrise Peach Sunrise counter for the win. The psychology of this match made sense; it didn't go on too long. Momo again, Tam wind up c- coming out of this match better than she was uh, going into this match, which is the sign of a great champion and a great run. Uh, I thought this was fantastic. It hit all the high notes. The psychology made sense. The selling was there. There was no wasted movement, and uh, you can kind of tell this was like one of Tam's, you know. One of her really, really biggest matches up until this point, you know, early into 2019. And obviously, here we are three years later. She's one of the biggest stars on the roster. I just went at four and a quarter stars. Absolutely loved it. I actually gave you four and a half. I can't believe I've given the Tam match a higher grade than you. Wow, look at that. <laughs> and you're on time today. Look out. Look out. It, might, it might snow again. It might snow again here in Pennsylvania. I think Tam's growth is the seventh anniversary show that we reviewed a few weeks ago, and, and Momo's, in fairness has been startling. Um, I think this is really um, Tam's like real breakout singles match. Um, the crowd were fully invested in her, and that was all a testament to her magnificent selling of the armor. Momo just went back to it and back to it and back to it, you know, p- literally trying to punt it at one point into the front row of Corican. Um, these two are another pair that have absolutely tremendous chemistry, and it shows... Um, on multiple occasions in this match. Um, Obviously, Momo comes out with a victory. Tam says she will never stop chasing the Y belt. How right she was. At the end of this, Sadie Gibbs and Jamie Hayter then arrive to challenge Momo for the Y belt with Momo agreeing to fight both of them one at a time. Now, spoilers, Sadie Gibbs would never get that match and, in fact, would only wrestle one more match in the company on the 19th of January before leaving and never coming back. Um, yeah, overall, thought this match was perhaps one of the hidden gems of the run. Um, and it, I know it's ridiculous to say, and probably people are like, a hidden gem, Momo and Tam. Um, I think it often gets buried because people will think about the Hazuki match, people will think about the Mayu match, and people will certainly rightly think about the two jungle matches. But I think this one is a really, really good lesson in how to sell and how to get the crowd on side. And again, you're absolutely right, Matt. It doesn't exceed the necessary time. I think it's under 17 minutes. Is it 16 minutes and something? 16 minutes and 54 seconds. It doesn't outstay its welcome. You know, you aren't expecting them to go 25 minutes and sell a ridiculous injury. They work really well together. They work a simple story and overall a really, really, really good match. Tenth title defense then was against Jamie Hater, who, of course, came out at the end of the TAM match, like I said before. That match would go down at Stardom Kyoto Max 2019. Again, would main event on the 2nd of February 2019 seconds. Momo defeating Jamie with the Peach Sunrise in 20 minutes and 43 seconds. Now, this match was to tie EO's white belt defense record of 10. Ironically, the woman and the rain that Momo um, ended up winning. The pair have faced off once before, Momo and Jamie, with Momo coming out on top during the 2018 Five Star Grand Prix. Matt, serious question. Is there a more beautiful, aesthetically pleasing venue than KBS Hall? Either that or the ECW arena, you know, 25, 25, 20 some years ago when I went to it a couple of times because it smells like popcorn and uh, stale piss and, <laughs> and uh, expired beer. I can't uh, believe you're <laughs> comparing the two. <laughs> Beautiful stained glass window, the imagery, stale piss. <laughs> yeah, that's it, man. Hey, the ECW arena, let me tell you, brother. And actually, I know I'm getting off topic during the... My catch wrestling seminar I did this past week of the ECW arena. The one guy that I was uh, working out with, and by working out with, uh, he was stretching me. And as I was letting him, 
uh, <laughs> he was talking about the how well the ECW arena looks now. And I, and I was at a New Japan show, I think, two or three years ago, I think right before the pandemic, and it's it completely different. But anyway, to answer your question, uh, no, I'm just going to say no. There's not a better looking venue uh, that I know of than that, just that stained glass window. It's absolutely beautiful. And it's almost at a point, and we've seen stardom just recently, they ran a couple of shows there. It's almost at a point where it's almost like, too beautiful like it's too distracting like ha- do you notice that when you're watching shows or matches that like you're watching the match and then all of a sudden like you oh wow someone just took a top rope german suplex what i i, I missed that when i was looking at the stained glass window <laughs> do you have that problem when that's uh i guess it's a good problem to have but like sometimes it's like too pretty you know yeah i mean it's it's a it's a good vo- it, you'd rather that than going oh my god the bits of the wall are falling down <laughs> i get that every weekend brother <laughs> Um, despite the venue, I re- in fact I actually texted you about this match and yeah. said I might be in the minority. I bloody loved this match. I thought this was great. Yeah, I'm just gonna go through my notes real quick because I kind of want to want to hear what uh, you said. But what I liked it started. Geez, I just I didn't even mean to do this. I'm looking at my notes. It started with Jamie Hader taking advantage over on Momo Watanabe with what catch wrestling. She was using catches Ken wrestling to. And we haven't really seen that. We've seen Deanna take the arm, uh, you know, in her match doing some old school uh, arm work. We've seen uh, Tam, the match before, taking out the legs. We haven't seen any old school catches catch can wrestling to kind of, you know, falter the offense of Momo Watanabe. That's what Jamie did. And Jamie was on the offense. I want to, I mean, you've seen that you just watched this match yesterday. What, 70% of the match? Would I be wrong on that one? I'd say it's more. I mean, oh my God. Like, Jamie completely dominates Momo here. Yeah, yeah. And I think I even, we were texting back and forth. I said, the where they really had the crowd, they were really smart. This was like just old school, 60s, 70s, early 80s, NWA, AWA psychology, where she grounds her with the, you know, with the chain wrestling, with the, with the catch wrestling. And she goes to work on Momo's leg. And Momo's leg is, you know, wrapped up a little bit here, as you can see, as her knee pad's coming down. And that's, you know, a target. So, I mean, Jamie's just working on it, working on it, working on it. And you're waiting for Momo to make that comeback because you know it's going to happen. And they're building and building. Like, come on, come on. You're almost at the point where you're, like, frustrated. It's just like, what is this going to keep going on? And then when she makes the comeback and she fires up, it's the exact perfect time. And I think we were texting each other back and forth. I said, no, I enjoyed the match as well because it's something different in this run. It's different psychology. It's Momo getting to work on her selling. It's Momo, not that she really needs to, because you can see the selling growth, you know, going on as this title reign goes on. It makes Jamie Hader look like an absolute monster. The fact that she absolutely dominates Momo in this run. And even when Momo loses the belt, which we'll get into, you know, in a little bit here with Teresa, Again, if you're scoring that on points, any one of these matches that Momo's in, this is a match she gets dominated really the most. Um, but again, that's proxy by design. You want to do something different. You can't keep everything cookie cutter. I mean, you can kind of have the same finish, which Momo does in a lot of it. She fires back up. She winds up hitting the B driver or a head kick. And then majority of these matches, she wins with the combination of the uh, tequila sunrise into the peach sunrise, which is absolutely beautiful. I will never complain about seeing those two moves back to back. But the timing of when they have the crowd, just as the crowd is getting ready, like they peaked, like they're getting ready to, uh, you know, they're waiting for Momo's comeback. Had they would have had the heat on Momo maybe 45, 50 seconds longer, maybe they would have lost them a little, but I think they had them just at the right time. And, you know, Momo makes her comeback, head kick, you know, she does what she needs to do, and the crowd just absolutely explodes. And as a performer, that is the beauty and the art of wrestling. And that's what this match was. They didn't do anything too crazy. The psychology was there. It made sense, and at the end, you had the crowd where you need to go. And again, I know I sound like a broken record. What happened to Jamie Hayter in this match? She comes out of this match better than she went in. So bravo to Momo, both both ladies on this one as well. But I had this one three and three fourth stars. Yeah, I mean, we obviously again we're talking a lot about the limb targeting, but I thought Jamie did it in such a way that it was almost uncomfortable to watch. I mean, Jamie is absolutely relentless, and at times it looks untidy which simply plays into the bruiser character she's portraying concentrating more on inflicting pain than looking pretty and i thought that the early dragon screws were an emphasis of this and i love the way just simple little things like as jamie's hooking momo's like she's punching the knee as she's doing it you know proper trying to grind momo down and i just i loved everything about the way she went about slowly but surely just 
pulling apart Momo. I really enjoyed that. Plus, she's got an absolutely exceptional Shining Wizard. Like, I did not expect that when she came off the ropes. It was beautiful. Um, there was also one moment where Jamie literally tosses Momo in an exploder suplex, and Momo's legs hit the top rope. It looks really, really scary, but again, this match is the hidden gem of this run. And, you know, I know I said that about Tam and Momo. That certainly is one that often gets buried in the shuffle. But this one, this for me, is the sort of diamond in the rough. And I know that makes it sound like the run's bad. I don't mean that the run's bad. I just mean that this is a match that doesn't get spoken about enough. And it should. There's a lot of matches. There's a lot of matches to go through. There is, absolutely. I mean, my only real qualm is that it potentially goes maybe, maybe a minute or so long. but. Even so, I mean, I think it's the third longest or the fourth longest of this entire run. Does it need to be that long? Maybe not. But I thought they filled it, as you said, absolutely brilliantly. And they timed it pretty damn well. I gave it four and a quarter. I thought this was magnificent. Post-match, Momo calls out Mayu and Arisa for a tag team title shot at her and Utami. But both women and this is important, say they don't care about Arissa. And they both say it multiple times. Oh, the irony, how that's going to play in later. Um, also, something to point out, Mayu and Arissa's match with the Goddess of Stardom Tag Team Champions would end when Momo pinned Arissa. Again, something we're going to be looking at later. And we arrive then at V11. This is... Momo's chance to exceed Io's white belt defense record of 10. Momo laid down her own challenge for what would be her record-breaking win. Now, she wanted to do it against her old foe, Jungle Kiona, and then do it in Kiona's hometown of Nagoya to show her superiority. Um, and ultimately, Momo would defeat Jungle with the Peach Sunrise in 21 minutes and 23 seconds at the Stardom World in Nagoya 28, 2019 show on the 3rd of March 2019. Um, and basically, this is like their first encounter, but if that first encounter was on performance-enhancing drugs, Matt. Oh my goodness, Like you mean like steroids and PEDs? I, genuinely, <laughs> this is their first match on steroids. My, oh my god. I guess, <laughs> oh, jeez, oh I guess the hot take over here on the, <laughs> the Stardom cast. Uh, yeah, you know, one of the many things I liked about this match is it is in Jungle's hometown, so you automatically have a flip-flop. Jungle, regardless, is going to be the baby face, and Momo's going to be kind of the quasi-heel here, even almost working as a tweener. But the one thing I like, just even to give this match even a bigger feel, is they had, they were, they did the, um, tape the entrances like the backstage where you see like a zoomy like getting the water and everything ready for momo and jungles like stretching out like almost like in the hallway of the building i like that it makes it makes this match even bigger than it already is i always think that that's uh that's pretty cool when you kind of see them uh backstage you know um if you ever see me backstage for I, i'm coming out i'm probably doing push-ups and telling some really really bad dad jokes with the person that's uh on deck you know to go on go on to my <laughs> matches the eastern tension but i always thought that was really cool uh jungle here is a huge huge baby face obviously her hometown um she gets an advantage early on by she puts a lot of pressure on momo uh, with strikes with drop kicks uh momo tries to fire back with kicks which we've seen before so you think okay you know this is kind of rinse and repeat momo is going to uh take the advantage but she gets like one or two kicks in and then momo just fire or excuse me jungle fires right back up you know she's just constantly keeping pressure 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 on her um, she's then from here on, she concentrates on Momo's back. She has a really nice half crab and then a sharpshooter style submission. Um, Momo winds up hitting the double knees and then she hits the tequila sunrise, but Momo can't follow up because again, we're talking about selling here because of the back and she's selling the back and then jungle, uh, winds up getting out of the peach sunrise. It's a big forearm on Momo that we just know she's going to pay for later. And then she hits the jungle buster for 2.99. The crowd is super hot here. Cause I mean, they think that jungle is going to win the belt here. Momo, uh, or, I'm sorry, Jungle goes for a doctor bomb. Momo reverses into the B driver for a near fall and applies a crossface chicken wing. And I think this is where you see Momo's experience coming out because I, you think you can see Jungle is getting ready to fight the next spot. But she, I think Momo realizes, I'm going to hold on this 
cross-faced chicken wing a little bit longer because the crowd is really, really, really getting behind, behind Jungle here to make her comeback. So she holds that cross-faced chicken, cross chicken, cross chicken wing, excuse me, a little bit longer than normal that we see in her matches because now they have the crowd at, at a peak. And they really are dying to see Jungle to make the comeback. Um, uh, she winds up in the pop, pop a power bomb uh, uh, for two. Momo then follows up with the tequila sunrise. It's a big head kick. Usually we see the head kick uh, and then the two suplexes, but she kind of mixes it up a little here. She hits the tequila sunrise, the big head kick, and the, the peach sunrise for the win. I thought this was great. The crowd made this match even better. I mean, this could have been an empty arena match, and it still would have been terrific, but the crowd just added to it. Um, I thought, you know, go if, if I were to go back to 2019, I was to watch this match live. I thought this were, would have been the match where they crowned Jungle. I really didn't. I think the crowd felt that as well, especially coming off the, uh, the you know, when she hit the Jungle Buster. I just had three, four and three fourth stars. I thought this was an absolute fantastic match. And this might be, other than the Mayu uh, Red Belt match from 2020, probably the best Jungle match I've seen. I thought this this was absolutely fantastic. Great underdog story in what a, you know, going into this match, you have either one or two things are going to happen. The jungle is going to win the white belt or Momo is going to break EO's record. So you kind of have almost another stake into this match as well. Already everything putting on top of it. And these two did not disappoint. It absolutely delivered. What a match. I mean, <laughs> what, what else can you say? What a match. The crowd are molten for the int. I am match, and that just really plays into the intensity of this encounter. I mean, to start with Jungle targeting the leg, similar to the Jamie match, but on an intensity level that far surpasses that. I mean, you've got, but then you've got Jungle who hits that apron power bomb, which Jesus Christ, that apron power bomb looked horrendous. But then, rather than staying with the leg, which is what she did in the first match, she changes tack and starts targeting Momo's back. And that's really important because that change of tack could be the difference between match one and match two. Ultimately, it isn't. But in the match, you start to feel the momentum shifting towards jungle. But you also see the growth of Momo here. You also see how much of an in-ring, how her experience is growing because here, like you said, she was grinding out that hometown um, sort of support for Jungle by keeping that chicken winging, by just targeting the arms and the shoulder of Jungle, by just basically trying to grind out every little bit of resilience that Jungle had. There was another phenomenal kick out from a diving double Samato, a 2.99999. And this was all made better by Momo's best selling of the run. Everything about this match absolutely slapped. It's easily five stars for me. For me, it's the best match of the run. This, then the Mayu match. I thought Jungle was a brilliant baby face here i miss her massively and i really feel like that moment because don't forget she lost in nagoya here which is her hometown she then lost against mayu for the red belt in nagoya her hometown i feel like that moment we should have got but aren't going to where she finally gets that belt in nagoya that cathartic moment would have been amazing and unfortunately we're never going to get it but Overall, this match, absolutely fantastic. And I think that that is two five-star matches for me that Jungle has put on in a hometown. What a performer. And what a way to follow it than with Momo's 12th uh, successful gonna, I, title I, defense. I, I want to I cut you off with a quick question. So what match, Jungle match, you like better? The Mayu Red Belt match or this one that Ooh. we just discussed? Is, this, is that one? Is that one? If you ask me on Monday, it's this answer. If you ask me on Tuesday, it's another yeah, answer. Yeah, it's been a okay. long time since I've seen the Momo and uh, the Mayu and Jungle one. I, I think I've only watched it once, but oh, it's probably because I've seen this one more recently. I probably think it's this one. Well, I'm going to throw this out because this is on the Patreon. My uh, as we're coming up on April here, my birthday is in May, so a nice maybe little birthday present we could put the Mayu Iwatani Red Belt retrospective on the poll. If that's okay with you, sir. And uh, if you old listeners want to give me a, a birthday present, I would love to review that Red Belt run with you there, Mister Rob. Oh, 
it's Mayu Iwatani, my man. I mean, how am I ever going to be mad about watching more Mayu matches? Um, and that's how me and Rob, whenever we talk about something that we want to do, I think it's not even nine times out of ten. I think it's, 10. I think it's like ten out of ten. It'd be like, hey, man, you want to do this? Sure, no problem. Okay, no problem. Hey, man, I'm thinking about this. What do you think? Yeah, no problem. Go for it. Like, that's how this works with me and him. Yeah, sure. Okay, great. Hey, what time you want to record tomorrow? Does this time work? All right, man. Yeah, I'll see you then. And we're talking about Mayu, and Mayu is a fantastic in-ring competitor. We then go to, and this is potentially a mean transition, but... Wow. Wow. I saw you go with that one. Go ahead, brother. Oh, you'll see why in a minute. V12, uh, Andres Miyagi um, had just joined Stardom in February from Sandai Girls, making a debut at the Queen's Fest show on the 17th of February, joining a weather tie, and immediately making her presence felt um, as she tries to win one of the top tiles in Stardom. Obviously, Momo beats her in 20 minutes and nine seconds with the Peach Sunrise. Um, what's the best way I can... This match is a slog, Matt. Uh, in the immortal words of my dad's favorite wrestler, the late, great Rowdy Rowdy Piper, anybody that answers a bell, I have the ultimate respect for. And if you're on a stage of stardom, I have ultimate respect for you. Uh, this match uh, wasn't good. This was by far the worst Momo match I've ever seen. Uh, Miyagi, despite having an awesome last name, uh, her offense is slow plotting, very sloppy looking. This match went on way too long. Momo did her best. The finish was exactly what it was. Tequila Sunrise, Pete Sunrise. I gave this three stars and uh, no disrespect to anybody in this match. But the less for me said about this, the better. So I'm just going to leave it at that. If you want to continue to talk about this match, my friend, go right ahead. But uh, like I said, uh, you know, some some of the old timers will tell you less is more. And the less I talk about this match is uh, is the better. 20 minutes and nine seconds this went. She went just... nine. It, nine, genuinely, nine. I'd have rather seen the the 20 minutes go to Saki than see this go for 20 minutes. I have nothing against Andros Miyagi. I've seen very little of her matches. She might be fantastic, and this might have been an off day. But, yeah, this wasn't great. They built the match around the pile driver. Um, you know, Miyagi targeting the now taped-up neck of Momo. Um, the pile driver was okay. I mean, it very nearly crowned Momo. Um, but other than that, I mean, it was it was meandering at best, a very very slow to get to the point we needed to. Miyagi didn't really have anything about her, though. I will say that staring at Rossi during the title ceremony and Ogawa's reaction is absolutely priceless. Um, but yeah, I I am not a fan of this match, and I'll be perfectly honest, it's the weakest match of the run um, by by some distance, Matt. Um, it's certainly not one. It's one for completionists only, let's say that. Um, however, Momo then nominates her next challenger as stablemate, fellow goddess of stardom champion, super rookie, Utami Hayashista. Utami wants to add to the four belts she already has. She's already the SWA Undisputed World Women's Champion. She's already the EVE International Champion. And she's already the future of stardom and the goddesses of stardom champion as well. They are going to go to war in New York. And that's where we go next for the 13th title defense momo watanabe defeating utami with the peach sunrise in 16 minutes and 34 seconds at stardom american dream in the big apple 2019 on the 5th of april now this was done in partnership with house of glory wrestling and was broadcast live on fight tv and we even have english commentary courtesy of fumi saito and jim valley um I'm unsure of the logistics of this, but it does surprise me that they didn't that this wasn't done in partnership with Ring of Honor or something like that, especially as Mayu is the Women of Honor champion. But that, you know, again, I don't know the logistics of how that would work. So, well, we I'm are. glad I, I'm going to piggyback off of that, sir, because as I was watching this match and parts of the show, I was like, we talked about before. I don't know if it was on air or before off air. I go to New York City every year for New York Comic Con, and I've wrestled in New York City a handful of times. It's only about two hours away. So as I'm watching the show, I'm thinking, man, if I would have been the Stardom fan back then, I would have definitely been to the show. You know, about two hour drive for me. Yeah. So then I'm thinking, okay, this was three years ago. And how I go about, you know, when I look at years, I look at what year WrestleMania it is. 
So we're coming up on WrestleMania. Actually, this week, we're coming up WrestleMania 38. So this is three years ago. Simple math will tell you WrestleMania 35. Where was WrestleMania 35? Oh, it was in, uh, it was in Giant Stadium, New York, New Jersey. Oh, I was there. I was in this area this whole entire weekend, Rob. Oh. I was at the I was at the Garden for the Ring of Honor New Japan show. I was at Barclays for the NXT show, and I was at WrestleMania 35. I was like, son of a gun! If I would have known what I know now, I would have 100% been at this show. <laughs> so, so you talked about the logistics. That's the reason why Mayu did wrestle on the uh, at, at the Garden show, along with you know uh, some of the other members of Stardom as well. So I think that that's uh, that's why I think they kind of just because this was this wasn't the main event. It was uh, I was at Stars versus Widow Tie. I think it was like a ten person or eight person elimination match, which I didn't uh, get into because I just I watched this match and then I watched a couple other things. But I was like, how about that? Because I was thinking, why would they just do one show? Because I was you know just looking stuff up. I'm like, why would they travel all the way to Japan for one show? I'm like, that's why because they had a couple people. Mayu wind up defending the uh, Woman of Honor Championship um at the garden i think it was the the next night and i'm like ah that's why but how about that i was in the similar similar area as the show and i i didn't go because i didn't know i didn't know how about that rob and there you go and there Anywho, you go that's oh, why that's why they didn't run the show with ring of honor ring of honor was slightly preoccupied with the whole <laughs> madison square garden thing perfectly understandable <laughs> there it is there it is uh this is really good uh, i like watching this utami stuff because it's just like Everyone tells me about how great of a rookie she was. This was only three years ago. You know, like you're like two years and chains away from her, the beginning of her red belt run. Just amazing how good she is. But the one thing that I noticed during the show and this match was the uh, the bottom rope was really, really loose, which sometimes can throw your footing off. Sometimes it'll throw the bolts under the springs underneath won't tighten the mat enough and the boards make it a little loose. So I was kind of worried about that, but that didn't seem to bother these two women at all in this match. I thought this was really good. You know, Momo starts with pressure. Utami uses her strength to uh, to come back. They they had a, an American style pace, like they knew their crowd. But they always say, "Know your audience, know your audience, know what you're getting into." And maybe the fact this was the co-main event, maybe they watched some of the earlier matches, or they were smartened up by somebody else. And it's kind of you know, do a little slower pace, do a little more show, you know, showmanship. And you got that, especially Momo towards the end. Because the crowd was so into Momo. You know, when she was kicking out of stuff from Utami towards the end and hitting her big moves, this place was coming unglued. Like, Momo, the way she kind of switched just a little bit, like from regular Momo, Momo into this title reign, where she's like maybe the last five or six minutes of this match, a little more Americanized Momo, was absolutely perfect. She absolutely knew her audience. She had Utami in the right spot. Not that Utami needs to be carried, even though she's a rookie. Um, but... um. Obviously, I, I was a big fan of uh, Utami when uh, when Momo was going for the uh, the Peach Sunrise. Utami countered to Inside Cradle, which the crowd really, really bid on. She winds up hitting the head kick, the Kilo Sunrise, Peach Sunrise for the finish. I was at four to, four and a quarter stars and a standing ovation from what I can tell you personally is a very tough New York City crowd uh, or Queens crowd to try to impress. But they were very impressed on this one. So uh, good on both of these two piggybacking entirely on what you've just said this wasn't the first show that the crowd had seen either the rope had actually got broken on the previous show so there'd been a show and then stardom came out so this crowd had already witnessed a wrestling card and for them to be as loud as they were and you're absolutely right momo was stupidly over in the u.s at this point um and for two 19 year olds to have the New York crowd eating out of the palm of their hands on halfway through the second card that they'd sat through is testament to just how good both these women are. I mean, it was a great match, and I'm not going to go into every single move, you know, because we've already talked about it. You've already talked about it, Matt. Um, I thought the submission drama in this match was tremendous. That was actually what I was most pleasantly surprised about. You expect the strikes, you expect the power moves, especially from Utami. But I thought the submission drama was great as well. There's one moment where the start of the match, they seemed to want to, Momo especially wanted to make this quite a friendly match. And Utami slaps it as though to say, yeah, we can respect each other, but I don't want any favors from you. Okay, we wrestle properly. And from there, Momo switches gears and the match switches gears as well. I mean, there's a 
another ridiculously close two count when uh, Utami gets a hand up from the Tequila Sunrise. Momo, um, Utami does everything she can to weaken Momo's neck, trying to hit the torture rack bomb, but she never quite gets that move away. You mentioned it before, standing ovation, tremendous reception from the New York crowd. I thought this was phenomenal. And even at this stage, you could see the incredible star potential in Utami. And Momo, at this point in this run, genuinely looked like she could have been the biggest thing since Io and Kairi, which makes the fact that her push sort of sputtered after her white belt reign and the whispers of Bushi Road not thinking she looked the part, all the more sad. Because it wasn't Mayu doing the introduction at the start when all the stardom wrestlers came out. It wasn't Kagetsu. It wasn't B Priestley, who I don't think was the red belt champion at this point. So Kagetsu wasn't Hazuki. It wasn't Hannah Kimura. It was Momo. Momo was the one who was speaking English and introducing the roster. So they obviously had a lot of stall in Momo. I want to talk to you a little bit after we've got past this last match about what Momo has done since. But let's move on. I gave that four and three quarter stars as well. We move on to match 15 in our little retrospective. And it is what would have been Momo's 14th successful title defense. However, on Stardom Gold May 2019, almost a year to the day, where Momo took the belt from Io Shirai on the 18th of May 2019. She loses the belt to Arisa Hoshiki, who pins her with the Brazilian kick like she threatened to do all those months back in November when she returned in 12 minutes and 57 seconds. Um, obviously, we get here because Orissa Hoshiki won the Cinderella Tournament 2019 on the 29th of April, going through Saki Kashima, Natsuka Tora, and then beating Konami in the final. Um, just an important thing to remember heading into this match, Orissa accused Momo of throwing fake kicks and then threatened her with the Brazilian kick, and both Utami and Momo refused to take Orissa seriously during the build-up to their Tag Team Championships match. And look what happened, Matt. Yeah, uh, and this one, you, you know it's going to happen. You know, if you're watching these two enough, and again, we're going back and watch this knowing just what fantastic reign Aris is about to have, and we love her, and we, 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 you know, we miss Aris. She's absolutely fantastic competitor. You know you're getting a lot of strikes and a lot of kicks, and that's what you want, you know? It's like... Yeah, I went to a steakhouse, I ordered a steak, and God damn it, I had a good steak. And that's what this was. <laughs> uh, so you know you're going to get there. So it's like you're kind of sitting on the edge of your seat just waiting. You know, who's going to pull the first one off? Who's going to hit the hardest one? Who's going to hit the biggest combination? They start out with wrestling, which is smart. You know, like, don't engage just yet. Let the crowd build, let it build towards. They start out with some really good wrestling, and then here come the kicks. But Momo does a little something different with her kicks. It's basically she kicks, and then she hits a move, kicks, and hits a move instead of hitting like three or four. She kind of wants to get that big shot in, but doesn't want to do a kick exchange with Arissa because Arissa at this time is the only one on the roster that can go, you know, kick for kick for her or almost, you know, even beat her, which obviously she does. But then the match towards the middle is basically all built around Momo trying to hit uh, the Peach Sunrise onto uh under Rissa, kind of working on the neck as you see you know obviously Arissa has that history of uh you know sore neck and back problems and Arissa does a really good job of always getting out uh eventually Momo winds up hitting a flurry combination she hits the uh the peach sunrise but she winds up uh getting into the ropes she winds up kicking out at this point the crowd is at an absolute frenzy this is this was a you know really good point for Rissa. she makes the comeback she gets a flurry of strikes uh then she hits two brazilian kicks for the win I was at four and a half stars. I thought this was really good, but it went under 13 minutes. Uh, considering the fact that some of the matches were on longer, maybe it was the fact that they knew when uh, Rissa was in the ropes on the Peach Sunrise, that's where they had the crowd, and maybe they cut it a little bit early. Uh, again, four, it's four and a half stars. It was fantastic, but I would have liked to see this match maybe get two or three extra minutes, and it probably would have hit that four and three fourths and five star range for me. But I thought this was great, and uh, you know, everyone was trying to figure out how to beat Momo. You know, taking out the leg, taking out the back, taking on arm, trying to drag her into deep waters and lot longer matches, maybe even trying to, you know, drop her with some big moves and suplexes, but just really took somebody that was just a little bit better at kicking and two really big ones at the top of the head that, you know, basically puts Momo out and ends this uh, this reign at, you know, 13 successful defenses. 
completely agree with you. And actually, uh, my I'd actually written down to ask you, are you surprised that this is the third shortest of the Momo reign behind the Saki and Tora defenses? Um, but because of the shortness of the match, they were able to maintain the intensity, which I think is important in a match like this for these two. And that moment, you mentioned it before, Momo has the peach sunrise, but the beautifully timed moment when Arissa's leg literally limply falls onto the rope, breaking the count at 2.9. That is majestic timing. It is perfect. There's one moment as well when both women are collapsed in the corners and the crowd is eating it up out of the out, out of their hands. And you can tell how invested the crowd are when Arissa pins Momo. And you can hear the reaction. There's one guy on the hard cam in a red shirt who cannot believe what he's just witnessed. He is absolutely stunned. It's hilarious. Um, but overall, a really well-crafted match. Again, you've got two strikes in there who didn't necessarily just rely on the strikes, which I thought was really, really good. Again, really, really building on Momo as a competitor. And it seemed that at this point, Momo was destined for bigger, better, brighter things. And I mean, if we look at the aftermath of Momo dropping the white belt, she challenged unsuccessfully for the red belt a further three times. Now, all the things I'm going to say are correct as of recording. So it's the 29th of March as of recording. She challenged unsuccessfully for the red belt a further three times against B, Mayu, and Utami, which means that she is, at the moment, 0 for 4 for the red belt. She hasn't challenged for the white belt since losing it to Arissa. Wow. She, she's won the Artist of Stardom Championships for a second time with Azumi and Utami at the end of 2019. She won the Goddess of Stardom Tag League in 2020 for a second time, finished runner-up in the 2021 iteration, and then runner-up in the 2021 five-star Grand Prix. On the flip side, she was overlooked to perform at the Tokyo Dome as part of Wrestle Kingdom, but was selected as one of the four participants at MetLife Dome in September 2021 as part of the New Japan Wrestle Grand Slam show. She dropped the Goddess of Belts, uh, Goddess of Stardom tag belts in July, the ones with Utami back in 2019. Um, she won them again for a second time at World Climax after her heel turn to join Oedetai. Now, Matt. Yes, sir. We look at this run with, quite rightly, almost God levels of revealment. A plus, right? Your teacher grading this in A plus. Absolutely. Right? If we're grading this, okay. it's A star. Absolutely, one hundred percent. I said it before in the New York match that she had with Utami. Momo felt like the star, like the icon, like the center point of stardom. Do you think she's lived up to the potential she showed during that run? And if you don't, is it necessarily her fault? No, uh, I, again, I don't know the inner workings of stardom. Obviously, um, you know, talked about it before. Bushi Road comes in. They don't think Momo has the look, yada, yada, yada. I understand it is, at yeah, yeah, one point, it is, it's a cosmetic business. I mean, it really is a, at some point. Um, I understand that. I think Momo, you know, is a beautiful lady. I understand, you know, but Bushi Road is looking at the Julias, they're looking at the Tams, yada, yada, yada. Um, so to answer your question, I don't think it's on Momo because I don't think she, I don't think you can put that against her wrestling. Her wrestling in this run and going forward, you know, from losing the belt to her wrestling in 2019 until, you know, as we're recording this the end of March of, of 2020, 22, her wrestling's fantastic. Her wrestling is fantastic. And I'm going to answer, you know, I have three questions for you. And that's actually, you know, man, our chemistry is fantastic. But that literally flows into my first question for you. Now, Momo is only, what, 22, 23 as of this recording? As of this recording, yeah. Okay, so I'm just saying as of this recording, can we put Momo in the same category as a Scott Hall, a Roddy Roddy Piper, a Rick Rude, a Ted DiBiase, a Jake the Snake Roberts as the greatest wrestlers to never win the heavy world heavyweight title? I think, barring any injury, I, I think that she's going to win it at some point. Uh, we talked about it all the time on the podcast. I, we think she's going to win it sometime this year. It'll be a crime that if she doesn't. But if, say, you know, she was to retire today, which, I, geez, I mean, I would cry, you know, 
like I'm a four-year-old kid skating their knee on the playground. She was a retired today. Can we put her in that category with the all those wrestlers I just said as the greatest wrestlers to never win the world heavyweight title? Which obviously would be the red belt for uh, stardom. I mean, it's difficult to to argue about that. Um, the way I see, or I think the way Bushi Road sort of felt about Momo at the time after this um, was that she was more like an Ishii. Uh, if we're talking about it in New Japan terms, where if the card was a bit lax or they needed a main event, they parachuted Momo in because they knew they'd get a good match. As opposed to, you know, focusing a program on her, she was often an afterthought. Um, and, you know, she ended up going from the de- the absolute leader of Queen's Quest to, in a lot of people's eyes, the fourth most important. So... It's on the booking. I think it's on the booking. It is absolutely. And, it is absolutely on the booking. And it's weird because we, we talk all the time about how great the booking is. And I think that's the one miss. And maybe this is just all, you know, with the heel turn, maybe it's the slow burn of, you know, this is maybe the thought that they had, you know, going a year, year and change. This is what they wanted to do is we would have her so close. We would have her so, you know, almost winning the five star. Who won the five star? Sherry. What does Sherry wind up doing? She won the red belt as this, are you know, she, you know, she has these two title matches going in, you know, to world climax, these two giant shows where they drew really well. So it's like that, that could have been Momo. That could have been Momo's spot. But is it by design? Because the booking is so well. You know, I know I'm, we're getting off topic just a little bit. Like, look at the bottom of the card. We love what they're doing with Waka. So how are they missing at Momo? But again, the story's not done. You know, the story's not done. I just watched Infinity War yesterday for the thousandth time because it's on TV. You get halfway through and you're like, what the heck is going on? And then you get to the end. You're like, oh, man, I can't wait for the next one. Maybe that's what we're doing. You know, she's only 22. Let's see how the story plays out. But as of right now, I, the booking's failing her. Again, this could be the genius thing all along. You know, Rossi Ogawa is an evil, evil genius, you know, and he's dressed up sometime like the Invisible Man from uh, the Chevy Chase movie. So, Fair but enough. I don't know. Fair see enough. what happens. Yeah, absolutely. And it was just something that, you know, especially after having watched this run and rewatched a lot of these matches, that you realize just how good Momo is. And. You know, you do. Genius. Yeah, it seemed that the only way her star was going to go was up. It seemed like inevitable that she was going to get that red belt. It seemed inevitable that it was coming soon as well. But obviously, you know, it stalled. Obviously, you know, we can't take away from the fact that she's finished second in the five star Grand Prix this year. She main evented what was stardom's biggest show in years when she main main evented Osaka um, Dream show with Utami. You know, it's a big show. She was on top of that card. You can't take that away, but I feel like some people feel that she's underachieved, and I just wanted to get your take on whether that is Momo's fault, or, you know, has she plateaued, or is it the booking? And I think we're both in agreement that it is the booking. But moving on to by the numbers, let's have a little bit of a look as we finish off, as we round out this retrospective, by the numbers, Momo Watanabe's reign. At 18 years old, she is still to this day the youngest champion to ever hold the white belt. It's the fourth longest reign with that belt, standing at 358 days. Only Yuzuki Aikawa with 618, Orisa Hoshiki at 370, and Kairi Hojo at 364 have had longer reigns with the belt. She has got had the most successful title defences with 13. A cumulative match time of 4 hours, 16 minutes and 15 seconds at an average match time of 17 minutes and 33 seconds. She main evented 11 shows and 6 Corican Halls. And she averaged a successful title defence every 27 and a half days, which is the fourth best title defence ratio of any white belt champion behind Santana uh, Garrett's reign and both of Io Shirai's, but it is the highest of any woman that has held the belt for more than 200 days. That in itself, to me, cements Momo Watanabe as the greatest white belt champion we've oh, ever had. There again, man, we're flowing. Here's my second question to you, sir. 
as far as now, I don't. I'm assuming you have not seen every single Kyle Rain in Stardom, and neither have I. But for the one that you have seen, is this a top three, like top three or four? Uh, whether it's Red Belt, White Belt, High Speed, Goddess, Artist, is this like you know in the top three or four for you? Yes, one hundred percent. Okay, top three. Yeah, I, yeah. I have EO's uh, Red Belt that we did number one, and this is is do this or Arissa. Uh, either two or three, and then the the Kari one that we're going to review, I heard is fantastic, and I only seen a little bit from there, so I'm excited to review that one. So okay, and then my final question for you, there, good sir, I get asked this quite a bit, and I'm shocked that I've never even asked asked you this question: Who is your Mount Rushmore of Stardom wrestlers? Now, the majority of people, and again, it's your opinion; you can say whatever you want. The majority of people will always have Io, Mayu and Kari on there, but I'm just curious uh, is if you agree with that and who your fourth would be. Hmm. Okay, let's say let's say that Threedom are on there, and I feel that Threedom deserve to be on there. Um, I mean, there's a couple of people that could go on there. You could argue that Yuzuki Aikawa deserves to be on there. Um, you, you know, for the work she did early on, you can argue that Nene Takahashi deserves to be on there. Um, you could argue that Momo belongs on there. That, that's exactly what I'm getting to. I had now I get asked this question. I always have them three. There's there's cement that they're not going anywhere. And then I'm usually, well, you know, seven days out of the week, I'll put Momo on there, two or three. And then I'll put, you know, maybe Nene's on there. Maybe it's Kagetsu. Maybe it's Arisa. Maybe it's Yuzuki. But after I after I watch this, it's cemented four. It's cemented. It's number. I'm going to go in order. Eo's one. Mayu's two, Kari's three, Momo's four, and I have no idea who number five is. And no, and it, it, and that's my list. You can put whoever you want on it. You could put whatever, you know, it's your opinion. But to me, those are my four. Uh, like I said, Momo was kind of on there two out of three days, you know, two out of three days out of the seven days a week. Uh, you know, kind of after I watch this, I'm like, nope, that, that, those four are my four absolutely cemented on there. And I kind of just want to get your opinion on that. If you yeah, put Momo on there. I think as well, you are take into account longevity as well. I mean, she's had an... And what did she debut in? 2014, I think. Was that her debut? Um, so in terms of longevity, she's been with the company a long, long time. Um, I think she, I think she has to be on there. If she's not on there, I feel like winning the red belt would get her there, definitely. I feel like that's the only thing stopping her from being a number four if she isn't already, if you know what I'm saying. Yep, that's exactly why I kind of, I'm like, I don't know, Momo, just because she hasn't won the red belt, but it's like, well, no disrespect, but is B. Priestley better? Is Tony Storm better? And even Kagetsu, as much as we love Kagetsu, is Kagetsu's runs better than this one? You know, is she even a better tag wrestler than Momo? Because Momo's had some great tag stuff, tagging with the Zumi and obviously Utami, you know, won the, the tag league with both of them. So it's like, yeah, you throw all that into consideration. Yeah, Momo is definitely the fourth on there. Well, and with that, we'd love to hear who your Mount Rushmore of stardom wrestlers is. But for now, we have run out of time. We hope you've enjoyed listening to us reminisce about one of the greatest tile runs in stardom history as much as we have watching and reviewing it for you. We'd love to hear your opinions on it, so please leave your comments underneath. The May poll will be up very, very shortly. Maybe we'll throw some Hazuki matches on there to see if we can persuade Matt that that isn't Hazuki's best match. Who knows? But in the meantime, thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for subscribing to our Patreon. It really does mean the world that you are supporting us. Um, our World Climax review will be out by the end of the week. We're just working on logistics for when we are going to record it. Um, you can talk to me on Twitter at real Rob Goodwin. Matt, where can they find you on social media? You can find me on Twitter and or the Instagram, just search Matt Turner OF and I appreciate your support. And for the thousand time, thank you for everyone that voted for this retrospective. I hope you guys enjoyed our review as much as we enjoy talking about it. We certainly did. And in the meantime, thank you so much for listening guys. And we will talk to you guys again for insane April. soon.